Thank you very much. So I want to start out by asking, why are you here? Why are you here? Anybody want to venture an answer? Yeah, go ahead. Martin brought breakfast. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. The guy can protect people who need God uh, and uh, the responsibility. I appreciate that. Anybody else want to venture a, an answer? That was a very good one. Both of them. Breakfast was provided and responsibility. So one of the things that, that, uh, that I try to challenge in this is to take a look at, and, and Kurt kind of mentioned it, what's our here? Where, where are we? Not physically, building-wise, ministry-wise. Uh, where are we in our ministry, and where do we want to be? And what's the gap? You know, Moses painted this tremendous vision, this tremendous picture that God gave to him, and then he gave it to the, to the people we're going to a land flowing with milk and honey. And, and as he gave that vision, he said, this is where we are, and this is where we believe, I believe, God says he wants us to be. So where are you, and where does God want you to be? As a, first of all, as a, as a leader, and then as a, uh, as a ministry. Where are we? Where would we like to be? So, first of all, this, this material that you have in front of you, this is uh, the mini camp version of our No Man Left Behind training. And just to make you really feel appreciated, uh, appreciative of today, the normal training starts on Friday night at 7 o'clock, goes to 10 o'clock, then the next morning starts at 8 o'clock and goes till 4 o'clock. So you guys get the abbreviated version, and you're getting the same material. Uh, we're just not going to do a lot of the hands-on. We're going to do some of the hands-on, but the rest of it, I'm going to encourage you guys, uh, leaders especially, um, anybody's welcome to take this, and, but the leaders should take this, and then you can go online and actually download it. This is the action plan. This is a uh, literally a year-long what do we need to do to be an effective ministry to men? And so this, uh, I'm going to encourage you that with the mini camp, we give you the basics, and then you spend the, the uh, time in your leadership team, and we'll explain that in just a little bit too, going through this thing. So this is not so much uh, prescriptive, uh, telling you what to do, as it is perceptive, showing you why you need to do it, and then how do you do what you need to do. So that's what we're going to be doing, is why should we have a leadership team? Why should we have a ministry to men? Why should we, uh, why care? And, and then, how do we get to that place? So the vision of Man in the Mirror, the vision of the Area Director Initiative, and uh, Kurt said I've been with him nine years. I was the first Area Director hired exactly nine years ago this month, uh, Valentine's Day, which was really, uh, shows men uh, and uh, our lack of perception sometimes. We started our training on Valentine's Day. Uh, what, a, what a great way to, to not be with your wives because wives weren't there. We tr flew down to Orlando and, and did our, our training. But uh, that was exactly nine years ago, and I started with, uh, there were 17 of us at that first training. Our goal was to have 330 area directors across the nation. Reason for that, there's 330,000 churches in America. Did you know that? 330,000 churches in America. And our goal was that each area director would have 1,000 churches to work with, oversee, minister to, consult, uh, you know, just be the, the men's ministry guy for 1,000 churches. Uh, we all raise our own support, and so as a result, we do not have 330 area directors. Uh, we have uh, just over 100 right now that uh, are, are doing this work of working with churches and, and bringing you know, this kind of material, but also uh, just bringing the consulting. And that's what we do. We're not, we're not vendors. We don't sell stuff. We, we have a lot of resources, a lot of materials, and that's what we are. We're resource providers to help your ministry to men become more effective. And here's why. And someplace I set that remote down. This is why we do what we do. I asked you, why are you here? This is why I'm here. Right now, and these are the numbers that are in your book, uh, your notebook, there are 127 million men aged 15 or older, and that's according to the 2010 census. So chances are that number is greater than the 
2,000, or the 127 million men, 77 million of those men make no profession of Christ whatsoever. I mean, literally, they would say, not only do I not know God, I don't want to know God. I mean, our culture has definitely become godless and less God in this regards. 73 million children, 18 and younger, and tonight, 36% of them will go to bed in a home without their biological father. How many of you grew up in a uh, single-parent home? Okay. I, 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 my hand is up as well. My dad died when I was five months old, and um, I, I was raised by my grandparents until I started school. And so I, I, I know what that is to not have a biological father, but uh, then my mom made the choice to bring a dad in who was abusive and uh, that, that marriage lasted just a few months literally and my mom went from being the the widow reed to the divorcee reed and this is 60 some years ago and she was kicked out of the church uh, my doctoral thesis was titled the church is the only army that shoots its wounded uh, here was a woman who needed the church more now than she did before and the church wasn't there there are 30 6% of those 73 million children who tonight will not have their biological dad and will they have the church standing there? That's, that's our concern. That's our heart is what about that? 40% of first marriages end in divorce. 40.8% of all children you see that last statistic? 40.8% of all children are born out of wedlock and we say, yeah, we've, we've got a problem. 16 to 20 million men will be in church, well, and this was pre-COVID, some of these numbers. 16 to 20 million men will be in church this Sunday in one form or another. Out of 127 million men in America, 16 to 20 will be in church. And of those 16 to 20 million that are sitting in the pews, one in 18 of those men is actually in a discipleship process. That, that would be like, picture uh, two baseball teams, nine men going out, 18 men going out to play baseball, and none of that, well, one of them has ever seen a baseball game. One of them. So we, we, we throw the, the baseballs and the bats and the bases and the wall and everything out there. We say, okay, go play ball. And, and what, would, what would we have with only one of the 18 men ever having seen a baseball game or read the rule book or knowing anything about baseball? What, what would we have? We'd have circus. We'd have chaos. There'd be guys picking up balls and chucking at each other like dodgeball or swinging the bat. or you know, they, We'd be doing all sorts of crazy things. And that's what we see in our world today. Chaos. I, I see a lot of heads shaking. We, we agree. There's chaos because men don't know the rules. Now that's outside the church. But let's take a look in the church. For every 10 men in the church, and the one I want to point out first of all is down below, all 10, these are 10 men in the church tomorrow morning. Of those 10 men, all 10 are struggling to balance work and family. Now, I found that to be a little bit different here in the South than it was when I would teach this up in Chicago. Um, you know, but it's still true. All 10 men, when they're at work, they're thinking about family. When they're with family, they're thinking about work. So we struggle with that, that balance. Then take a look at these. Nine will have kids that will leave the church. Nine men in the church today will have a child walk away from the faith. Some of you probably already have experienced that, where your kid doesn't, you know, do, not only doesn't go to church, doesn't want anything to do with church. Eight will not find their job satisfying. They just go to work. It's just, some, it's a paycheck. It's something to do. But there's no real joy. There's no satisfaction in it. Six will pay the bare min monthly minimum on their credit cards. In other words, Six of ten men in the church are having financial struggles. We looked at that last month in the breakfast uh, next door uh, of the financial struggles that men have today. Five will have a major problem with pornography. And I was jokingly, but it's not really a joke, say the other five have a major problem with lying. <laughs> Is there such a thing as a minor problem with pornography? You know, not, not really. So we have that. and That's a struggle that... Men in church, and by the way, Man in the Mirror does constant research. That's, that's our role, is to study men and churches and the effectiveness of churches. As a matter of fact, this that we're going through today is not all original. It was taken from churches that were effective uh, over the last 10, 15 years in building ministry to men, 
and we looked at what were their best practices and put them together into this, this system. But um, during this COVID experience, the number of pornography, uh, the number of abuse, the percentage of all of those things has just exponentially gone up. It's, it's crazy with men just sitting in front of their computers uh, of the number of men, Christian men, that are struggling with pornography and struggling with their relationships in their marriage. Four will get divorced. Why? Because they have a struggle with pornography. <laughs> I mean, four are going to get divorced, and this is the saddest. One in ten will have a biblical worldview. And what we mean by that is that one in ten looks at, when they look at life, they look at it through this filter of thus saith the Lord. One in ten men in the church that are basing their lives, their decisions, their direction, their marriage, their parenting, their, their work, their priorities, one in ten men that are basing that off of scripture in the church. And then take a look at the whole culture and we see why Houston, we have a problem. We see the, the problem. So what we say is that that in order to make the world right, we need to make churches right. Would you agree? That, that the church is, it still is the hope of, of our culture. Man, it's under abuse right now. It's not doing its job very effectively right now. It's taking a lot of heat in, in these days. And uh, you know, stand up for righteousness, and you're going to be pelted down. You're going to be tried to be shut up. Our cancel culture, the first thing they would love to cancel is right here. And, and every other one of us, 330,000 across the nation, they're saying, we don't need you. We don't want you. So do we just curl up and shut up, or do we start fixing what needs to be fixed? So to get churches right, if we're going to get churches right, we need to make families right. Our families have taken a hit. I mean, it's, it is crazy. In my 40 years of ministry, I've never seen anything like what, what the, uh, the culture is throwing at Christianity and, and the lack of stance that we have. Well, if we're going to get the churches right, family's right. We need to make marriages right. We got a lot of work to do on marriages. Marriage has become, again, uh, a, a joke to a lot of people in our culture that we don't need marriage. We don't want marriage. We, you know, they, they, there's a rejection. It's just a piece of paper. And if we're going to get marriages right, we got to get those women right, right? <laughs> yeah, the, don't say that too loud. <laughs> we got to get men right. And again, we could reverse that. If you get men right, you get marriages right. You get marriages right, you get families right. You get families right, church right, and you get the world right. So I'm going to back up on that. And how do we get men right? If that's our challenge, and that is our challenge, right? That's, that's our need. How do we get men right? Well, the number one way that many churches do in getting men right is nothing. That is literally the number one way most churches do to work on their men. Nothing. We are infamous. Men are infamous at being passive. Go ask your mother. Right? You know, go, go find out what mom thinks about it. And so we, we are a passive gender that just says, eh, I'll, I'll think about that later. I'll work on that later. I'll do something about that. So uh, why wouldn't that translate to the church and the ministries that say, we'll think about that later? We, we got other priorities at this point. Do you know that um, if you took a look at the, the normal church budget, and you can do it by, even by looking at the normal church website, with the church website, you'll see men's ministry. So you click on it, and this is what, this is what I do. I click on men's ministries you know, every time I find a website. You know what the number one uh, thing on men's ministries is? Under construction. They don't have a website for their men. And if you go and open a program, a bulletin, if you go to the church and you open it up and you look at women's ministries, youth ministries, children's ministries, men's ministries, maybe men's breakfast next Saturday. And that's about it. We, we just are passive. Number two, we give them books, self-help books. And I could quote one of the biggest self-help book authors by saying, how's that working for you? Right? Dr. Phil. You know, we, we just give, you, know, you just need to pick yourself up by your own bootstraps. Do you know the rest of that quote? 
You've heard that quote, right? Pick yourself up by your own bootstraps. You know what the actual quote is? No man can pick himself up by his own bootstraps. You know, try it. <laughs> try putting your boots on and pulling yourself up with, with it. You, you, you can't do it. But that's what we say to men. And I'll just grow up and fix it. Or number three, in the church, we give them a lot of religious work. As a matter of fact, number four, work, work more, work harder, you know, work, work better. And so we just give religious deeds. The real answer is, we believe, discipleship. You disciple men. Now, that's an easy answer to give. Yeah, sure, just disciple men. So the, we actually have this up here. You know that it was 10 years ago, 10 years ago, April, was the deep water horizon. Remember that? Remember when the, the, the well exploded in the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico? And so what's the first thing they did? Well, they tried to enclose it with a boom. Uh, you know, they, they put the, the barricades around, and they found out real quick, this is a lot worse than we thought. So they started bringing in skim boats. And at one point, there were 550 skim boats on the surface of the Gulf of Mexico skimming oil, crude oil off, 24-7. And as a result, they were able to skim 20 million barrels of oil off of the surface. The problem is the well was spewing out 220 million barrels of oil. So if all they did was skim the surface, they'd still be skimming today, right? Ten years later, they'd still be skimming the surface because the problem was the broken well. They had to cap the well. So we have in our society a lot of different issues. Abortion is an issue, right? And there's a lot of money that's being thrown at pro-life ministries and anti-abortion uh, roles. Uh, there's laws. There's all these things. Because we don't like abortion. We hate abortion. What it does. Alcoholism is a problem. Pornography is a problem. Sex trafficking is a problem. All of these things are critically necessary to work on, to work against, to fight for, to fight against, right? But all of them are surface issues. Every one of them. And that's not to, to put them in less light. But what causes abortion? Why is there abortion? Why is there abortion? Because there's an unwanted or unplanned pregnancy. How did that woman get pregnant? Just natural conception? Some man couldn't keep his zipper up. Or, once he didn't keep his zipper up, didn't take responsibility for this life. So if you fix the broken well, fix the man... You take care of abortion. And we can take care of all of those other sex traffic. Why is there sex trafficking? Because there's men who want that kind of illicit sex. So uh, I, I'm going to share this later, but I'll tell it right now. The woman at the well, we know that story, right? The woman at the well that Jesus talks to her in John chapter 4 and gives to her life and gives to her hope and tells her what, what real faith is, what a real God is. Jesus came along. But do you know before Jesus came, there were six men in her life? Six men in her life. And so think about that, that she had to come, she on her own had to come and find Jesus because six men failed her. So we need to have that understanding that if we fix the broken well, disciple men, we'll take care of an awful lot of society problems. What do we want to do? We want to change laws. We want to, you know, we want to change presidents. We want to uh, you know, elect somebody better. Uh, no. Fix the man, you fix the problem. Amen. So how do we do that? Our vision, the man in the mirror's vision, and I hope that you guys would share that vision, and I hope this is why you're here today. We, uh, our, our ministry is to serve pastors, <coughs> serve pastors, train leaders, transform men. That's our main goal is to see men transform. We help churches, help church leaders create a discipleship pathway for every man in their church. We, uh, Kurt kind of uh, gave the, the seminar in a nutshell when he said, we want to blow up your men's ministry. Blow it up. Get rid of it. So that you have a ministry to men. A ministry to every man in your church. That's ultimately what, when you walk out of here today, the, the number one hope is that you look at not just a men's ministry. Because what is men's ministry? I mean, that's not, when we say blow it up, it's not get rid of it. It's, you know, let's blow it up so that it becomes a ministry to every man. Most men's ministries, breakfast, seminar, a yearly retreat, reaches a 
about a, a good men's ministry is reaching about 20% of the men in the church. So if uh, this, again, I'm a little bit ahead of myself here, but I'll throw it out now. If I were to ask you, uh, Martin, I'll ask you, how many men in your church? <laughs> Martin has sat with me before, so I, he was the wrong guy to ask. But we, we ask, how many men in your church? And most pastors or pastors will say, you know, we have uh, 200 men in our church, let's say. Uh, the last church that I was pastor of, we had 211 men. I knew our 211 men. That was our men in the church. Uh, we're going to explain later, that does not, that's not all the men that were in our church. But 211 men in the church. And so then we ask the question, well, how many in your ministry? Uh, you know, 30. How many men in your church? 200. How many in your men's ministry? 30. How many men in your church? 200. How many men in your men's ministry? All of them. You said it right the first time. <laughs> All of them. All 200 are in your men's ministry, or your ministry to men, even if they're not in your men's ministry. That's what we want to get to. So discipleship. That's ultimately what we're looking at today is discipleship. So I'm going to ask you, what is discipleship? And there is no wrong answer on this. So just, you know, what, what is discipleship? Say it again. Role modeling. Okay. Training in righteousness. Building relationships. Basically, that's it. That's, that is two-thirds, two legs of a three-legged stool of discipleship. And that is the training in righteousness or, or teaching and building relationship. But there's a third leg of that stool that we often leave out, and that is a process. A process for discipling men. We kind of leave it to chance that we're going to build relationships and we're going to teach something, something. And, and so the process is saying we're going to have an intentionality about this. And I would, I'd encourage you to, I gave you a pen and a notebook, write these three things down. Intentionality, intentionality, we're going to mean this. We're intentional about it. We, we understand this is fixing the broken well. This is the most critical. We're going to share in just a moment why it's the most critical. Intentionality, number two, multiple entry points. You know what we do for men's ministry? We give a guy a choice. Here's breakfast. Here's a seminar. Here's a retreat. And, and we stop with those um, one or two entry points. And number three, and this is the one we're going to spend quite a bit of time on, know your men. Know your men, where they're at. We'll hit that later. So this is the big idea. Kind of skipped ahead here. Content, relationships, process. This is the big idea. Your system is perfectly designed to produce the results you're getting. In other words, if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you always got. So your system, your men's ministry is perfectly designed to get the results you're getting. So if you don't like the results you're getting, you got to change your system. That's, that's ultimately what we're saying. So we've got these things here. Uh, four, or it, we call it the fourfold assessment. This is how to assess your ministry to men. Yeah, this is to ask how you're doing. Now, don't get hung up in the weeds on this. This is not something you're going to do right now, uh, other than ask yourselves as a team, how are we doing? How are we doing? All of us know men who failed, right? Would you, would you agree? Anybody here not know a man? Was that? Uh, but we all know men who have failed. Do you think that man woke up in the morning and, and you know, shook himself out of bed and said, today I'm going to be a failure? <laughs> no. We don't plan on failing. We don't, we don't think we're going to fail. 
But then when, by the end of the day, we realized I was a jerk to my wife, I was a jerk to my kids, I was a jerk to my co-workers, I failed. So what do you think happens from morning till evening in a man's life? What happened? I always say, I do really good until the idiots show up. <laughs> uh, in Chicago, that was as soon as I pulled out of my suburb, uh, there were the idiots on the road. But uh, yeah, life, culture, uh, you know, traffic. Uh, you know, but bottom line, what, what's the broken well? Why, why do those things cause men to fail? Distractions. Why do distractions cause us to fail? not focused. We didn't wake up in the morning thinking, Lord Jesus, how can I be more like you today? And then we didn't have an intentional plan. So the, the second question is in your notebook. Estimate the percentage of men in your church actively involved. What are some of the opportunities for discipleship that your church offers to men? And why do men get involved? And why don't other men get involved? Why do men get involved in what you do? Why do you think, why do you think uh, men came to breakfast today? 20 men, 25 men, why were they there? Good breakfast. Why else? Okay, because they did see the importance of it. They're simply invited. They're abiding? Simply, simply invited. invited. They were invited. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Fellowship. We do like fellowship, usually on our own terms, but we like, we like to be with other men. Why don't other men get involved? Why don't men come to breakfast? Okay. Priorities. Priorities. Don't recognize any importance in it. Don't, uh, haven't seen it. So, you know, we say that most men, in all reality, most men are like a junior high kid walking into the school cafeteria for the first time. Scared. Doesn't want to be embarrassed. I always say the number one fear of every man, I don't want to look stupid. So if I think I might look stupid in this situation, I'm not going to go to it. That's not necessarily a conscious thought, but it is a thought. I don't want to look stupid. And so, have you ever heard Brian Regan, the comedian? Yeah, his, his whole first routine was on, uh, don't want to look stupid, and so far I'm not doing a very good job of that. So, w one of the things that we do say is that if, if a church follows this system that we're introducing today, this no man left behind model, if you follow this, we have empirical evidence, uh, an actual uh, sociology class at, and uh, University of Houston did a study on the No Man Left Behind uh, after it had been implemented for about uh, seven or eight years, and they found that every church that came to a No Man Left Behind training and implemented the, the model, within two and a half years, they had seen a 48% increase in the number of men attending church and an 84% increase in the number of men in a discipleship process. So this thing works. Not because it's you know just this tremendous insight. It's because it actually is an intentional process. And, and when we do an intentional process, we see good results. All right, let's take a look at the next thing. Uh, where should I actually point this to get it to work? Up there, okay. So this is the model. Kind of looks like a conveyor belt. Kind of is a conveyor belt. It takes from the raw material of an undiscipled man over here and brings him to being a disciple and in the, uh, in the actual book uh, up here is a church being built with these bricks that we are producing living stones uh, it, within the church so this is you know we're, we're going to run through all of this uh, quickly and then we're going to take it bit by bit so the first thing that you're going to see is the portal priority which is down here the portal the, the the conveyor belt is built on these three fold platform portal priority which we're going to explain in just a moment man code three strands of leadership then it's going to take 
from wide to deep, the five types of men, and the thing that drives them to becoming disciples is over here, vision, create value, capture momentum, sustain change. So don't worry about not getting all of this right now. We're going to do it uh, bit by bit. And then across the middle is the all-inclusive ministry to men. That's going to be the difference in what you may already be doing to what we're going to challenge you to start thinking. Okay? There, there's three things that are up here that are probably unique or uh, you, you may have thought of them, but you don't have the intentional process or aren't doing that process to actually do them. Those three things are uh, to know your men, to be intentional, create, capture, sustain, and again, uh, the portal priority. Those are things that we're going to, to challenge today. All right? So I've got a couple of notes here that I do want to cover. Number one, and you might want to write this on the... Uh, you know, above the wide aspect, when it says wide to deep, I don't know if you get, your notebook doesn't have the, it has wide to deep, <clears throat> or should have, might be a fill in the blank. Fill in the blank, okay. So above the wide, you're going to write interest oriented, interest oriented. And then all the way over to the right, above the deep, study oriented. Would you agree with that? The guys who come to you know, most men's ministry events, they're interested in it. The guys who come to your Bible studies and your deeper studies, they, they want to study. They want to, uh, you know, back to the uh, equipping in righteousness. So here's the key. This is perhaps one of the most important keys to understanding ministry to men as opposed to men's ministry. No event or activity or study is going to reach every man in your church. No event... No activity, no study is going to reach every man in your church. So if you want to reach every man in your church, you can't have an event, a study. You've got to start looking at what's going to be the best for everybody. So I've often compared to what you're going to be looking at today is a cafeteria tray. You choose what you're going to put on the cafeteria. All we do is be a kind of a high-tech cafeteria tray. You choose what your men, you got to know your men, are going to be most impacted by and most interested in. You can put on here, you know, we offer a lot of resources, and so does Iron Sharpens Iron, No Regrets, uh, Men's Fraternity. I mean, there, when, when I first started pastoring, and I wanted to, I wanted to reach our men, I, I believed then, 40 years ago, as I believe now, as goes the man, so goes the church. So I went into our local Christian bookstore. We, I was pastoring in Quincy, Illinois at the, point, at the time. We had a, a Christian bookstore in town. And I went to it, and I, I asked, where's the men's section? And actually, I can remember this, the lady that was behind the counter laughed. <laughs> she goes, well, we don't really have a men's section, but here, follow me. And she took me back. Here was, we, I think we went by four shelf sections of women's books. And then we came to the men's shelf and it had two books on it. You want to guess what those two books are? Uh, were there 35 years ago? <laughs> no, they didn't have any secular books, although that would have been one that would have been there. No, they had um, Making of a Man by Gene Stedman. Gene Stedman or Gene Gates? It's been 35 years ago, I can't remember. And Man in the Mirror by Patrick Morley. Those are the only two books that were there. Literally, the only two books that were on a men's ministry thing. You go now, you see tons of resources. Well, you actually, you can't find them in a Christian bookstore anymore. They're, they're, they're gone. But you can go online and you can see tons of books, tons of resources. Well, how do we use them? That's, that's the critical component. How do we use them? So we're pretty good. If we took a look at this over here, we're pretty good at the event, the create value. We, we have a lot of men's events, and we have a lot of men's studies. Where we aren't good, I started to say where we stink, uh, where we're not good is right here, capture momentum. We don't do a good job of capturing momentum. So the critical components of an effective ministry of men is a regular study of the Word of God and authentic relationships with other men, and then knowing why those two are important. All right, so let's jump into the next page is the five types of men. 
Oh, I was supposed to be zipping through all of those as we did this. So we'll come back to each one. All right, so here we go. Five types of men. Normally, I would take five chairs and I would line them up here. So picture that there are five chairs sitting here. And the, the five chairs are going to represent where the men in your church are sitting. Uh, and they are in your church. The first chair is the natural man. I think that we have him listed as the man who needs Christ. The natural man. The natural man wakes up in the morning and says, what am I going to do today? It's all about, he wakes up in the morning thinking about himself, right? He cannot comprehend the things of the Spirit. The Bible says, the literal translation of the word, they are moronic to him. Pray? Why would I pray? I'll just do it myself. Go to church? Are you kidding me? I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have any reason to go to church. Sing? I'm not taking a shower. Why should I sing? You know, there, there's, there's just not this thought in their mind of Christianity or of church. They do not receive the things of the Spirit because, again, they're moronic to him. They are those six men with the woman at the well. I was sitting in a restaurant when we uh, lived it back in Chicagoland, sitting in a restaurant with my wife, and uh, the way that we were structured in the, in the seating, there was a guy sitting right here, and I could look over his shoulder and see that the entire time that they were ordering their meal and doing whatever, he was sitting like this with his phone playing a game, playing a video game. While his wife or girlfriend, I'm not sure what their relationship was, was chasing their two-year-old toddler all the way around the restaurant. She'd try to put him in the high chair, he'd scream. She'd, she'd pull him out of the high chair, he'd take off. She was, she'd chasing him around. And the whole time, he sat there playing his video game. And finally, somebody went up to him and said, Hey, buddy, man up! He wasn't very appreciative when I did that, but, um, <laughs> but literally, he needed to be told what it meant to be a dad what it meant to be a husband, or at least a man. And probably uh, no one, including a dad, had ever shown him. It wasn't that he was being that overtly rebellious. He was ignorant. So for these men, and we are going to try to draw these up here. This is the man, if you remember the old Campus Crusade circle. This is the man who has me on the throne and Christ is outside of his life. As a result, his life is pretty much scattered, random, no order, no real uh, intentionality in his life. It's just, it's all about him. So what do we do with that man? What do we, we, as, as Christian leaders, as men's ministry, ministry to men leaders, What's our goal with this guy? Do you know him? See, that first goal has got to be, we've got to know who he is. And here's the point. This is about 75% of the men in your church. Now, you say, he's not in our church. No, he's really not. He maybe came last Easter. Maybe he was even there Christmas Eve, you know, before COVID hit. Um, maybe his dad got buried you know, the, the funeral was held at your church. So if somebody stopped him on the street and said, you go to church, men will answer the way they think you want them to answer. That's why some political surveys are really skewed, because we'll answer the way you, we think you want us to answer. So if you ask a guy, do you go to church? Yeah. Where do you go? Agape Church. And Johnny's going, I've never seen this guy. Well, he probably hasn't ever been here, but his wife comes. His kids come to special events. He drove through the trunk or treat. So this is his church. Do you know him? He doesn't know Jesus. And he's not going to know Jesus until we know him. And, back to our chart, create value for him. So what is going to be the value in this guy's life that says, I, I, need, I need that. What do you think this man would respond to of saying, yeah, I need that? What do you think his felt needs are? 
Divorce? Or close to divorce? Yeah. Got a hit bottom? Anybody else? Talk to a relationship. He is, whether he knows it or not, looking for a, a good friend to good friend relationship. So uh, again, we've got to identify and enlist him. Put, put him on our prayer list. Put him on, this is our outreach list. Have that man in your sights. Patrick Morley tells the story of his dad, that his dad hit kind of business rock bottom. And it was to the point that it was going to lose his marriage and therefore his two boys. And he was, he'd, he'd hit this place where finally he drove by a church and he said, I think I said where I need to go. So Sunday morning, he got the family around and, and, he, and he came to church. And he said when he reached for that handle, that was the hardest thing in his life to reach for that handle. And he said well, as soon as he did, fortunately, Praise God, there was a man that opened the door for him and said, Hey, welcome. I don't think we've met. And he said, That little interaction caused my dad to come into the church and impacted now Patrick Morley. I was sitting in our, uh, in our church one day. Our offices were not in our church building, kind of like you guys. We had a separate office building. It was about a mile away. And so there was some reason I was at the church building. And so I uh, I hear this knocking on the door, which never happened. You know, I figured, okay, UPS is delivering something, and they know it's supposed to be over there. So I, I kind of came up the stairs a little frustrated. And there was a guy very well-dressed. I mean, he was wearing uh, an Armani suit or uh, something equivalent. Outside uh, under our drive through was a, a BMW. This guy was an obvious uh, high-level management guy at one of our big corporations in Chicagoland. So I, you know, we had two sets of doors. I opened the first set, and I was standing there, and I opened the second set. And before I could even say, could I help you, he goes, why am I here? And I said, I don't, I'm not real sure. Why are you here? And he said, I, I had to avoid the traffic, uh, the construction up the hill. And I said, uh, yeah. He goes, uh, I didn't see it till I came up over the hill, so I had to make a quick left turn. And he said, the first thing in my th th thought in my mind was, man, I'm glad I've got this car. I couldn't have made that in a junk heap. He said, then it hit me. I'm thankful I've got the job I have so I can afford the car. I'm thankful that I have a, a home that I'm going to in this nice car. And he goes, I'm thinking this as I'm coming down your hill. And he said, I, I finally hit, I'm so thankful that I have everything. But then why am I so empty? You sit, he was sitting at our stop sign. Why am I so empty? And he said, there was, he said, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. It was like a voice that said, there's your answer. And I turned around and looked and said, that's my answer? It was our church. But he did a U-turn, came up around the church, knocked on our door and said, why am I here? And that's, most men will never hit that place but that's where they're at. They have found all the success. Did you read what Tom Brady said after his third Super Bowl win? Is this all there is? Is this all there is? Now he's won four more, and he's probably still asking the same question, unless somebody has talked to him. So this is the natural man. The next guy is cultural Christian. The cultural Christian makes up a large portion of, of your church attendance. Now, he actually thinks about, he has introduced Christ into his life. So Jesus is in his life, but he's still on the throne. So he basically wakes up in the morning and says, all right, God, what are you going to do for me today? Right? That's his prayer. What are you going to do for me today? I don't have it. I didn't give it to these guys. But I'm going to encourage you to write this down. Go to YouTube and watch Ryan's story. Ryan's story. Now, there's several of them, so you, you've got to find the one that I'm specifically referring to. But it's basically the rich young ruler who said to Jesus, what must I, what did he say? Do. What must I do? To have eternal life. Ryan's story is a guy 
that he seems to have it all together. Well, what this video is, just so you know and you find the right one, it's a guy saying all the right things, but above him, the bubble is what he's actually thinking and, and what his thoughts are. And so it might also be titled Plastic Jesus. Ryan's story, Plastic Jesus. Because he, uh, at the very end he says, my faith is real. My God is real. And then a bus passes by with the sign that says, my Jesus is plastic. So uh, the, that's this guy. It could be the parable of the sower and the seed. That this is the guy that uh, he's been trampled on and the, the seed just doesn't take root in his life. We could illustrate it with ushers. None of you guys are ushers. You remember the, the um, uh, Everybody Loves Raymond episode where his dad was an usher in the church and he wanted to be the usher and his dad wouldn't let him? And ultimately it came down to the reason, uh, you know, there's three reasons guys are ushers. One, I'm serving God and my church. Two, I, I, I'm, um, I get to walk around. The third one is I can help others find God. But that was Ray Raymond's dad's reason for being an usher. I get to walk around. I don't have to sit and listen to the sermon. And he didn't want him to be an usher because he didn't want him to find out he really was not serving God. So our goal with this guy, with this guy, is to engage. The first one was enlist. This one, we want to engage that guy. Somebody said uh, we want to invite them. Yeah, we want to invite this guy. We want to get this guy involved in more than just attending church. So we'll provide that. Number three, the third guy is the biblical Christian. And again, they're picturing our chairs. We got the natural man, we got the cultural Christian, making up about 85% of the men in the church, these two guys. And then about another 10% are going to be this guy, the biblical Christian. This is the guy that's coming to your Bible studies. He is this guy. He's taken himself off the throne, and he's put Jesus on the throne. Now, the reason I wanted to point out the chairs, his chair is his chair. You know, he's, he's sitting, whether it's his Bible study, his men's breakfast, his, his church attendance, he sits in his chair, and he really doesn't look down at these guys. He doesn't look down at them, he just doesn't really notice them. He's concerned about his growth, his life, his spirituality, and, and it's, it's right here. So he wakes up in the morning and says, okay, God, what can I do for you today? I mean, he, he the biblical Christian, is thinking about serving, attending, um, but here's the problem with a lot of these guys. We tend to isolate. And the, here we would say, the, with, the, with the, right before it was the parable of the seeds, this would be the parable of the hidden talents. This is the guy who doesn't know what he has. He doesn't know what he's supposed to do because he's not been challenged or heard that challenge. Well, what should I do? These men need mission or purpose. One of our workshops, by the way, is leading a mission-driven life, one of our seminars. And th this is the guy that needs to be challenged to lead a mission-driven, find out, what, what can you do? So here our, our challenge with this guy, not engage, but equip. We want to equip this guy with what he needs to serve, what he needs to grow. Johnny, you do not have a clock in this church. I guess they don't care how long you preach. Oh, okay. It's 10.04. We'll, we'll take a break here in just a second. So uh, we want to affirm this guy. We want him to, to know that God's gifted you, and, and we want to get him. Now, here's the, here's the thing. It's easy to get men to serve, to work. What must I do? <laughs> that, that becomes our challenge. It's, it, you know, to have a work party, you'll get guys to show up. Why? It was low commitment. I don't have to show up every week for the next 13 weeks. It's a low threshold. I don't have to study anything. And it's, I work with my hands. I, I get to do something. So this is a good way to get the biblical Christian involved is to get him to work. Have him, have him come help you cook breakfast. You know, you're not, you can do it, but have five or six other guys doing the stuff. 
and learning as they watch those guys being impacted by the speaking and by what's taking place. Ah, I, I, I like being used. So the biblical Christian needs to learn what he has in, in, in his hands. Moses was asked, what's that in your hands? And he needs to be asked, what's God gifted you with? And he also needs to be challenged, who are you looking, you know, are, are you aware of these other two chairs? So we got this little small resource called the Reach 3 card. We challenge our guys, and especially when we're doing one of these seminars, challenge the leadership team, challenge your, your, your biblical Christians, who are the three guys that you need to invite to this seminar? You need to start praying for right now, and you need to invite to come to this seminar. So this very simple little resource gets them thinking about the next step down. Okay, the next guy is the leadership Christian. And this guy sitting in this fourth chair. He wakes up in the morning and says, God, what can I do to serve you and others? He is focused on those three men. So, you know, he's, he's definitely this guy, but his life is much more in order as he's thinking about how can I reach other men? He is, in the parable of the soils, he's the fruitful soil. He's the mentor man, like Barnabas, like Paul with Timothy. Barnabas had his Paul, and Paul had his Timothy. So this is the guy who understands every man needs a Barnabas, every man needs a Paul, every man needs a Timothy. So who's your Barnabas? Who's the guy that's encouraging you? Who, who are you a Paul to as a Timothy? Uh, that, that you're reaching out to that guy. And so the goal with this guy is to constantly encourage him, just to continue to strengthen his courage of do the right thing. Now, the last, the last guy that we want to look at is the hurting man. We don't normally put a chair up for him because he can be any one of these four guys. Somebody said about the natural man, what's going to be when he hits rock bottom? He's a hurting man. When he reaches for that door of the church, it's probably because it's his last option. I was teaching um, this, this particular seminar, Success That Matters. Uh, and, and in the seminar, we've got, uh, there's, there's four sessions. The first session is uh, understanding God's, role, God's purpose in my life. The second one is how to, how to raise champions for Christ. And the third one is how to make my wife my new best friend. So there was this guy sitting in church. Uh, so, uh, not church, so we, we were having this in the foyer of the church. There were about 40, 45 men. They were in round tables, and they had the table leaders that were leading the discussion. You know, Again, we say the number one fear of every man is I don't want to look stupid. The discussion questions kind of bring out the fact that we're all kind of stupid, and so we feel comfortable you know, in the discussion. So he was sitting there. Uh, I wish I could actually demonstrate this. He, you know, he had his notebook in front of him, pencil on top, arms crossed during my first teaching session about knowing God's purpose in your life, eh. he literally was about two feet away from the table. During the discussion time, he got up and went to the bathroom. That's man's best friend is a bathroom trip when, when things start to get real. And he went to the bathroom. Came back for the second session, you know, raising champions for Christ. And he sat there about two feet back, arms crossed, didn't open the notebook. On the third session, when we started talking about how to make your wife your best friend, uh, the, the actual session is the 10 deposits you need to make in your wife's emotional bank account. By the way, what's tomorrow, guys? Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> it happens to be Valentine's Day. <laughs> and so, uh, again, the 10 deposits in your wife's emotional bank account you know, it's all these things we need to be aware of as husbands. About the third deposit, he slides his chair forward and starts opening the note, you know, this workbook. And finally he said, what page are you on? I haven't been really paying attention. I said, yeah, right, buddy. You haven't been paying at all attention. I didn't say that. But, but I told him what page we were on. And he said, what were those first three? And I said, this is like a good algebra book. All of the answers are on the back page. You can look it up. But um, after that session... He came up to me, and he said, uh, my name's Raul, not Raul, I'm Ron, and he said, uh, my wife came to this church last Sunday, first time she'd ever come, and she heard this thing announced, and she came home and said, if you don't go to that, we're through. He goes, I can't afford a divorce, so I'm here. 
He said, well, I'm glad you're here. Are you learning something? He goes, I've not done any of those things. Do you think that's our problem? I said, I think that could be your problem. Here was a natural man who got drug to church because he was a hurting man. Hurting. But that hurting man could also be this man sitting in the fourth chair. He could be the leader whose wife just passed away or who just got diagnosed with cancer or who just lost his job. His life now is not a, he doesn't need to focus on leadership. He needs to be ministered to. So the hurting man is the guy that the, the rest of the men kind of gather around and say, we're going to take you through this. We're going to be here with you through this pain and, and through the process of, of healing. So all of these men are sitting in your church. Johnny, tomorrow morning. Martin, tomorrow morning. Every one of those men are going to be there. Here's your job as a leader of your ministry to men to know them. You got to know that guy that you've never seen before. <laughs> what brought that man to church today? Why today of all days is he here? And by the way, when we get to the next session where we talk about uh, the the man code, if he walks into your church and you don't have the proper man code, he's probably not going to stay. You know that uh, church growth statistics and statisticians tell us that a man makes his mind up of whether he's going to come to that church or be in that church within the first seven minutes. So uh, that's obviously not the sermon. It's probably not even the worship. It is, did he feel, did he feel at home? And so uh, it, it's a critical thing that we're going to look at next. But what I want you to do right now is to understand, uh, you know, what, what are our men facing? The next page has an exercise here for you guys to do. And this is where I'm saying that the mini camp is a little different than the, the day-long training. You'd spend about 25 minutes together right now doing this. Uh, you're not going to have 25 minutes. We're going to take a break uh, for those of us who need to hit the restroom real quick. Uh, we'll, we'll take a break. But then uh, take about five minutes and just start thinking through who are, and this is where uh, your leadership team, which again, we're going to cover in just a moment, your leadership team, this is your number one assignment. First assignment is to start listing the men in our church. And you're not judging them. Uh, we always get this. Well, I don't want to judge them and put them in. You're not going to go to them and say, hey, buddy, you're one of our cultural Christians. I'd like to talk to you. <laughs> this, is our, this is an internal working tool. This is for you guys to know, all right, we've got, we have 75 men that we all came up with, our leadership team came up with, that don't attend this church, but they say they do. What are we going to do to reach them? And, and that's the purpose of this audit. Or, or we've got, you, your church may have 15 hurting men right now. We know of 15 men who are going through a deep water. What are you doing to reach them? You know, my, my job as our national field staff chaplain, we've got 100 guys, about, about 100. It varies, goes up and down. Um, about 100 guys, and right now I've got, if I actually count them, I probably have almost 20, 20% 20 of our guys who are hurting men. They're going through some deep water financial or health or marital. We've got four guys that are going through marital issues. There are area directors. That doesn't mean they're perfect. It doesn't mean that they're perfect husbands. So we've got four guys that are going through some marriage issues. We've got, back to that uh, kids walking away from the faith, we have a lot of guys who, they're now walking with Christ, but when they were parents of young children, they weren't, and they lost their kids. So uh, you may have a lot of hurting men. What are you doing to minister to them? You know what Man in the Mirror did? When, when we realized how many hurting men we had, they said, Ron, stop being an area director. You're our chaplain. We, we need somebody who's going to focus just on our hurting men. You may need to do that in this church and say, we need, or your church is, we need a, a chaplain. Somebody that's specifically reaching out to our hurting men. So let's take a quick break. It is 1014 right now. Let's be back here by 1025. We'll take a 10-minute break. We get into this threefold platform, and it is, uh, you know, if, if this thing didn't have a platform and starts working, it's going to shake itself to death, right? Any conveyor belt. It's got to have the solid foundation, and so does our thought process, our intentionality, our process for men's ministry. 
And the first aspect of that is the portal priority. Why are we here? What is the overarching purpose? This is in your workbook. What is the overarching purpose of your church, either stated or un unstated? Why, why does your church exist? The Great Commission. Yeah. So the central mission of the church, and these are, these are both brought out in this, these verses, Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, if I got it, can you say, you don't have to quote it exactly. It says, go and make disciples. And then do you know what Matthew 9, 37 and 38 says? The harvest is plentiful, the labor are few, so pray to the Lord of harvest for, for workers. And for my entire ministry life, and actually before I became a pastor, when I was in, so I, I became a Christian uh, the junior year of, my, uh, of college and went immediately to a Bible college. I went to baseball scholarship out to, uh, at that point it was Lynchburg Baptist College, now Liberty University. Played my last year of eligibility there and uh, started hearing immediately of, uh, you know, pray for workers. And go and make disciples. Then became a pastor uh, after, after my three years of seminary. I became a pastor. And for 40 years, we did a very good job of doing this, making workers and praying they become disciples. Right? Would you agree that that's kind of what we do? We make workers and pray they become disciples, which is the exact opposite of what Jesus said. So he, he challenged us to pray for workers. Not browbeat them to death, uh, you know, work or give or, you know, or, or else, but, but instead make disciples, pray for workers. What is a disciple? What is a disciple? If, if that's our challenge, make disciples, what is a disciple? You know what the actual word means? Matheteus, learner, pupil, follower. As somebody who's in the, the process of imitating and being like and becoming like their rabbi, their mentor, their, their teacher. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. And that was what a, a, a rabbi, uh, you know, literally the, the followers, his, his followers, wore the yoke. And it wasn't an oxen yoke. It was uh, the symbol that I, I'm, I'm with Johnny. And, and they would wear the yoke. But oftentimes that yoke was, it was more for the rabbi's benefit. It was, uh, hey, go get me my coffee. Hey, go get me my bagel. Take, you know, so the, get the right locks on there. And, you know, it, it was a lot, of, a lot of requirements. So when Jesus said, my yoke is easy, he was saying, I'm not going to put this undue burden on you. You're going to just learn from me and follow me. So we've defined this uh, disciple as this. 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. He's called, that's the salvation aspect, um, that he's, uh, in, in that verse it says, wise unto salvation. And then he's equipped, teaching, correcting, rebuking, uh, training. If you picture this, matter of fact, I'll picture it for you. This is the way, walk in it. Whoops, come off the way. Here's how to get back on the way. Here's how to stay on the way. That's those four in a nutshell. This is the way. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to teach you. And then when you have fallen, we're going to correct you. And as a church, as, as men, as disciple makers, that correcting has got to be done in love, but in truth. Speak the truth in love. And we've kinda, we, we kind of mess up there. We either don't speak the truth or we don't do it in love. And so as a result, people don't want to be corrected. When we do this in a biblical manner, then there will be the, the rebuking will be what you know, it said, uh, the faithful are the wounds of a friend, that you, you have my best interest in mind. You ever been rebuked? Anybody in this room? <laughs> Besides marriage? <laughs> yeah, of course you have. <clears throat> how'd you respond to it? It depended on who did the rebuking and how they did the rebuking. And if they spoke the truth in love, yeah, thank you. 
Then it becomes that instruction in righteousness. How do I, how do I get back on the way? And then uh, training me, giving me the right steps to stay this way. So this is the equipped part. And then the last part is sent. Sent to do, equipped to do good works. Moses with Aaron. David. Paul, the apostle. We see it over and over in the scripture of this. You're called, wise to salvation. You're equipped. We're going to give you everything you need. Now go. That's a disciple. That's what, you know, we're not just learners. We don't just become disciples. Get this. We are disciples to be disciple makers. We are disciples to be disciple makers. And if we lose some of that, we're just a learner. So, it's also, the next challenge of this is that it's heart-based. Discipleship changes the heart. One of the issues that I brought up before was the pornography issue. There are a lot of ministries, a lot of programs, a lot of even apps that help with you know, anti-porn. Most of them, if not all of them, are all about behavior modification. Stop doing this. And so you put a filter on your computer, you have somebody who's going to call you, you know, uh, but all of them are behavior modification. Genuine discipleship is heart transformation. It changes who you are. Uh, do we have pens? We've got a pen, okay. So that heart-based is love God, love your neighbor. That's what Jesus said was discipleship, uh, the central mission. Follow Jesus, love others, change the world. Love God, love your neighbor. It's more heart than performance. Again, that's one of those nice, trite phrases that we use. But it's, uh, discipleship doesn't just change my performance. It changes my heart, my why of what I do. Now, we're going to get into that in just a moment, a little bit further. So we'll, we'll basically just look at the fact that we want discipleship to be this portal priority this change agent in our life. The goal is to create an atmosphere. Here's the goal as pastors, as men's leaders. Create an atmosphere where life-on-life -life discipleship is natural and desirable. We call it in our, in our ministry the ministry of hanging out. That sometimes the best way to start a discipleship process is just hang out with the guy. Go hunting, go shooting, uh, golfing. Go eat. Just, just go with the other guy and, and the ministry of hanging out. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. We get stuck there. We make our men's ministry all about just hanging out with each other. And that's good, but it's not enough. It, it's not going to change a life. It's just going to begin the process of that discipleship. Now, what we want What's easy for us to, to fall prey to is just performance driven, a, a checklist. Hey, we, we ate, we went through the Bible study together, we did this for this eight week class, uh, we've, we're done. Discipleship is over. And basically, all we've done at that point is make a better Pharisee. We, we, we just have improved our outward look, but we've not changed the heart. My brother is a uh, worship leader at his church up in Tennessee. Um, right at Bristol, Virginia, Tennessee. His, he lives in Virginia. He goes to church in Tennessee. I don't know. It's crazy. But he's the worship leader on their first service, which is their bluegrass service. And he plays a five-string banjo. Matter of fact, that's how I ended up coming to Christ was I was his backup guitar player, and we were going to all these different places where he was uh, singing and giving his testimony. And he would always start out every time by saying, you know, a lot of speakers tell jokes. I don't know any jokes, so I just brought my little brother. And people would laugh, and you know that was funny. I tried that with my wife; it doesn't work. I'll tell you, <laughs> just just so you know, it doesn't work. But he wrote a song early in his you know singing career. Grandma used to call me her little Pharisee, for I would always be real good when anyone could see. I'm glad I'm not like other folks. Oh, aren't you glad I'm me? That's when Grandma called me her little Pharisee. He was actually seven years old before he found out she was not complimenting him by calling him her Pharisee. And the, the verse says, when I was just a little bitty boy growing up on the farm, and Glenn and Gary, Mike and Ron would often do things wrong, they'd sometimes fight, oh, what a sight, sometimes pick on me. When I'd go tell Grandma, 
she'd call me her Pharisee. You know, the Pharisees always were good on the outside, but there was no heart transformation. And so when we just teach or we just hang out, yes, sir. <laughs> yes. Uh, the, sad, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see. Sad, you see, yes. So, or, or worse, we become, you know, the prodigal's older brother. I heard a message a long time ago by Aaron Rodgers. The title of the message was, and you've got to pay attention to what I'm saying here, this little prig stayed home, uh, you know, because he was just a jerk. So this is, to the pastors in the room, I wish I would have seen this 40 years ago when I first started pastoring because every church has all of these things going and we get so wrapped up in all of this stuff, preaching, teaching, Bible study, private study, inform, seminar, stewardship, preaching, discipleship, evangelism. We're doing all this stuff, right? And almost every elders meeting in the last few years of my pastoral ministry at least one elder would say, we're doing so much stuff, and I, you know, we got to cut some of this stuff out. And I said, okay, we'll start with women's ministry. You go talk to Donna. <laughs> yeah, it, we, we don't know why we're doing what we're doing. And then I was introduced to this. Those are outcomes inside the box, and the ones outside the box are methods. Methods can change. Outcomes better be solid. We better be having these as a result. And ultimately, the outcome that Jesus said we better have is this, discipleship. If you make disciples, you have people serving in missions. You have worshipers. <coughs> you have vocational ministry. You have a stewardship. And these become all of the methods to make disciples. And if they're not making disciples... Should we continue to do them in the church? Probably not. Or correct them. Now, when, when an elder board or when a men's leadership team or when you know, leaders of any kind see this and realize, yeah, if we make disciples, we get workers. If we try to make workers, they don't necessarily become disciples. So it's critical that we have this as our poor. This is why we do what we do. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Now, he didn't say, bring them here to church and make disciples. He said, go and make disciples. Now, put this another way. It's on your next page. Same things, the exact same things are there. I, I, want, I want to say this. We confuse people in church. When people come to church and sit here, one week we're talking about missions. The next week, we're talking about small groups. The next week, we have stewardship emphasis, or it might be month. And, and they're going, what, what's your point? What are we supposed to be doing? So we've got to constantly drive the why. It's not that we want you doing. We want you being. We want you becoming. And when we talk about life change, discipleship, then they start getting the point. Every, every week, every meeting, every men's discipleship, or men's breakfast, men's seminar, we're talking about, hey, we're here to be more like Jesus. Now, the way we can do that, we can go serve in the food bank because Jesus said this. We, we can do this thing. We can go here. All of it is because we want to be disciples. So if a man hears, let's, let's use this as an illustration of stewardship. If a man hears preaching and teaching and seminars and small groups and Christian literature and private study, and it's all about giving money, he's going to think, well, as long as I give my money, I'm a good Christian. I'm a good person. I'm a, and all we've done is create donors, not disciples, not stewards. So it becomes simply giving money or giving time or, or serving or doing. And guys are great about using their hands. We'll, we'll do that, as I said earlier, low commitment, low threshold. I don't have to study anything. I just go do or I can write a check, or uh, you know, give, give the money. But, let's change this. If we come, to, uh, it all becomes performance driven. If we instead change their heart 
as it says in Mark, if we change their heart and we make it about a relationship with God and with man, now, yeah, I'm sorry, I should have said it's the next page. That love motivates to do stewardship. Now, instead of just giving money, I am using the gifts, the talents, the money, the abilities, all that God has given to me to change lives, to make a difference. So love motivates. We could, we could talk about other things besides stewardship on this. And probably one that, as I said, is a, is a big issue right now is pornography. I can either put filters on my computer to make me change my behavior so that I don't look at porn, or I can fall in love with my wife uh, and fall in love with God, the relationship with God and with man, love, love your, the Lord your God and love your neighbor uh, as yourself. I can obey the scripture. And now I don't want to do that. I want to please my wife and I want to please God. So discipleship, literally, discipleship changes my motivation for doing or not doing things. Discipleship causes me to worship. I, I said earlier, I actually have a sermon titled, I'm not taking a shower, why should I sing? And it's all about, I think it's Psalm 96, that's all about the different types of worship. I no longer worship because everybody around me is singing and I look weird not doing this. I worship because I know who I am singing about and to and for. I don't have to go do evangelism because I'm told you need to go evangelize. I want to tell people about this life change. I want them to have what I have found. It, it also, I don't, I, don't, I don't have to go to the jail because hey, everybody's going to the jail and you know, we need to go do this. I want to go tell these guys because Jesus said, you visited me in jail. And, and my heart says, I want to please him. So it isn't about the activities and the performance. Again, Pharisees' problem, do the right things and I'll be right with God. Instead, it becomes a genuine heart change. I actually have a, a book. All of my books now are, if, if you guys like a library, I've got boxes of books, church books. But one of them is The Pharisee's Guide to Total Holiness. It's a totally tongue-in-cheek book of, hey, just do the right stuff. No, be the right person. So there's a page missing in your workbooks. But I'm going to challenge you as a leadership team, um, we have these, and, and I don't have enough for everybody, but uh, leaders, you need to grab this. And then you can download as many as you want off of maninthemirror.org and, and print them out. But this action plan takes you to this, this uh, page that's missing to do an audit of all of your activities. Everything you're doing for ministry to men, men's ministry, church, uh, all those things that we listed up above, make sure you guys grab one of these. Um, does your activity focus on men's hearts or men's hands? Does your activity focus on outward or does it focus on inward? Does it uh, focus on discipleship or does it focus just on doing? And then what adjustments do you need to make to change that? So it's a great sheet. It's in here. It's a great audit to list everything we're doing and what's, what's the result of that doing. Okay? Discipleship porter priority. Number two. Very quickly, is the man code. Does your church have a dress code? It, it does. It has a dress code. Your church has a dress code. Shorts and flip flops. No, it, it has a, it's not printed and posted by the door. Hey, no thongs allowed. We had one of our speakers that talked about thongs, and he was he was referring to flip-flops, and he kept saying, you know, that, you know, he wore these thongs, and uh, every guy in the church what, what? <laughs> just couldn't picture him in a thong underwear, but uh, he was a little older and didn't understand that's what he was talking about. No, we have, a, we have a dress code. Your dress code either says suit and tie, business casual, t-shirts and shorts. If I were visiting your church tomorrow, if I walked into your church, I would know your dress code instantly. I, you know, just look around, and you can see, oh, I'm okay. Or, oops, I <laughs> should have had a tie on. Uh, or or uh, shouldn't have worn those thongs. But uh, 
I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to quote your message, but. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you also have a man code. You may not know it, but you have a man code. When a man walks into your church, he knows instantly your dress code, but he knows your man code. He knows whether men are valued here or whether men are uh, an afterthought here, whether men are just put to work here, whether men, you know, our, our church cares about women and children. Men, yeah, we're glad you're here. Uh, you know, so the, he picks up on that first impression given to men. Let's see what the next slide is. What is your church's man code? We literally had, we asked uh, you know, a group of men at one of these, give us your man code. You don't bother us, we won't bother you. <laughs> or, if you're a successful man, come to church here. If you have a wife and kids, bring them to church here. But this is the best. Come on. If you think you're tired now, come to church here. We'll show you what tired really is. <laughs> And all too often, that is the man code. Now, I want you to write these down. Uh, I'm going to give you about uh, 10 words. This is what your man code is made up of. De decor, decorations. Would you say that this room is man-friendly? It is. It's very man-friendly. Uh, the chairs maybe used to be mauve. I don't know if they're faded. But the, there's no foo-foo there's no banners. There's no, you know, most decoration teams in a church are what? Women. <laughs> so how do they decorate their church? Like, like their bathroom. You go into a man's bathroom uh, in, in the, many churches and it's like, are we supposed to eat this? What, what is this stuff on the counter? So, you know. <laughs> the big banners? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's not the fault banners. It's just that banners become something that gets stuck in a church and never changes. Uh, you know, uh, or murals. We had a mural in my first church, and it was probably about 50 years old, and it looked like it was 50 years old. It wasn't done well when it was done 50 years ago, but my Aunt Mabel painted that, and so it's never going to go away. And, you know, just things like that that the decor shouts man-friendly or not man-friendly. This is a man, you know, the gray, the, everything about this says, hey, men, men, you're welcome here. Take a look at your church through the eyes of a, of a first-time guest. Don't, don't look through your, yours. Uh, bulletin. And the bulletin or program uh, that I realize right now we're not handing any out. Most, most of them are online. Uh, but even take a look at your online program. Where does it talk about men? What does it talk about men? We used to start doing, uh, you know, I... I uh, had heard something about this before I even started with Man in the Year. We started putting uh, in in our program, you know, here's the program, here's the program, and you'd open it up and it'd be like, we would have little messages on the side bar like that. We'd, we'd put something that would be uh, a challenge to men or a, because, uh, why do you think we did that? Make them look. Also because men are looking for something to do during a sermon. <laughs> I don't want to hear this. So, so we give them messages that while they're not paying attention up front, they can pay attention to that and look. So just little things like that that men will pay attention to. Here's a key one, humor. Men love humor. They, you know, I'll pick up Martin again. Uh, you know, he, he had a couple of Freudian slips in his message a couple of weeks ago. Every time he preaches, okay. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. But I guarantee you guys remembered that more than you know, maybe some of the other points. If there's no humor, it's like, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> That's a critical point. Um, music. And again, it's not just the music that is sung. It's how it's sung. How many of you guys went to Promise Keepers in their, in their past, in their heyday? And, and what was the best part of Promise Keepers? The, I mean, the words, the, the, the messages were great. I don't remember the messages, but I could remember standing in the kingdom in Seattle with 75,000 men singing, How Great Thou Art. And first of 
all we sang, Be Thou My Vision, and then it went right into a cappello, no instrumental of How Great Thou Art. I get tingles to this day remembering that of just the Spirit of God falling on that place in such power. And then it was just, as soon as we finished singing, it was just hush. 75,000 men, you could have heard a pin drop. And then as though on cue, 75,000 men, roar, you just rah! And then they started banging on the back of the chairs in front of them and stomping on the metal bleachers. And it was about five minutes of just absolute chaos. Started the wave going around and then started going the other direction then started sweeping across the kingdom. And then again, just like somebody pulled a plug, it went silent. And we were in the presence of God. And it was just, whoa. But you know why we got there? We sang two songs, men knew the words, and sang it in a key that you didn't have to hike your shorts up so high you couldn't hit the notes. <laughs> Pastors, men's leaders, worship leaders, tell your worship team, lower it a notch. If you want guys singing, lower it a key. Get it down to where guys can sing. Take a look tomorrow morning around your church and watch your men. And if they're doing this, what are they communicating? I don't know the words. I don't know this song. Here's the problem. And again, I'm not picking on worship teams. I love worship teams. But they are, you know, it used to be you had a song leader, right? The song leader. Then we went to uh, worship team. And now it's worship bands. And most of those band members are talented musicians and singers. So they want to stretch their talent and, and you know, really show they have that. And so it becomes a show that we stand, stand, and watch. If I have one pet peeve, worship leaders, it's let me sit down. <laughs> Just let me sit. Because when you're singing a song, I don't know. You're introducing a new song. But, and, and I'm a typical man. You know, most men, if they don't know the song, they don't want to stand through it. So uh, music, quality, quality. Men expect and want and desire quality. So make your stuff look good. I've, 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 I've been to church here. I've been to church southeast. And what other churches do we have here? Are there other churches that are St. Mary's United Methodist? Anybody did that? Oh, okay. I've not been to your church tomorrow morning. <laughs> so, but um, I, I appreciate those three screens are used in here. And they're used well. There's a, you know, a side thing going, and there's a, have you ever been to a Mercy Me concert? A Mercy Me uses the pro presenter to the best ability that they can. I mean, they're, they're amazing with all the different drop-ins and stuff, and as an ADHD, I'm sitting there watching that going, oh yeah, they're singing too. But quality, quality, you know, don't, don't use junk. This is critical, vision, vision, and a vision it should be written, as Habakkuk says. It should be talked about. It should be told. It's got to be known. We're going to be covering vision in just a second of, of what vision truly is and what it means. But share in your vision. Uh, now, we went um, quite often. You know, I was pastoring in Chicago suburbs. We'd go to Willow Creek, uh, Bill Hybels, back before Bill Hybels took the plunge. Um, talk about uh, every, every time that man opened his mouth, you knew the vision. You knew what he was there for. It was, it was constant. It was written. It was uh, on every slide. It was written on the bottom of the slide. We, are, we exist too. And it, it was just a constant awareness of this is what we're here for. Let it be known. I, I've already touched on this, but I'll give this next word. Bathrooms. How's your bathroom? Does it have that odor? <laughs> you know church bathrooms? Church, churches have odors. They sit empty for a week. And then when people walk, it's like, what's that? So make sure your bathrooms don't have an odor, a lingering odor in them. Uh, leaders, by the way, not just the odors in the bathroom, because uh, all bathrooms are going to have an odor. But uh, what's your bathroom look like? Is, is it inviting? Is it someplace where a guy likes to go in? Uh, in Portland, Oregon, one of our area directors, I've been out there to speak a few times, they listen to this man code and so when you walk into their bathroom, when you reach for the handle, it's a hammer. It's actually a hammer that's welded to the, to the handle now. And when you open it, the first thing you see is the, the big mirrors, and they're framed with T-squares. 
And right above the mirror are two uh, deer heads, taxidermy heads. And then when you go over to the, to the uh, urinals, above the urinal, they've got uh, man, man challenges, man-friendly challenges. So as you're doing your business, you're reading this challenge. And uh, you know, uh, they actually have iPads in the stalls up on the wall. Uh, you, you, they're protected. You don't touch them, but, uh, you know, it's got stuff playing in there. So it's, it's a man-friendly bathroom. So think about that. Leaders. Do people know who your leaders are, and are your leaders men? Are they manly men? Because, again, that communicates uh, a man, man environment. I won't belabor that because sometimes I get in trouble when I do so. Uh, opportunities for men. Do they see that, oh, I could do something here. I could be used here. And then the last one is online presence. If your website says under construction, under the men's area, change it. You do something. Just the simplest thing. I mean, you could, you could get a high school kid to come in and do your men's uh, website. He probably knows ten times more than anybody in the church office, and he can you know, do, do a great work there. So again, what might your man code be? What the goal should be is that your man code says men are valued here. Men are valued here. Any questions on that? Kind of zip through those last two. The portal priority, the man code, and the third platform is this. Oh, by the way, there's a picture of a men's welcome center in a, in a church. Willowbrook, it's in North Carolina. And it's just a simple, you know, it just looks like a garage. And uh, they, they have a guy standing there that uh, gives out programs for what are they, what's coming up in his ministry this, this month. Okay? Three strands of leadership. This is the third platform. The three, it's the next page of your workbook. You know the, uh, the passage in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes says, Two are better than one. They have a good return for the labor. If one falls, the other's there to pick him up. Woe to the one who falls alone. Um, but then it ends that passage saying a cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. And so we, we've gone from the two, husband and wife, to you know make sure Jesus is there. I heard this joke, and Pastor, you can steal this, that uh, a, a little boy was at Sunday school and... Uh, when he came home, his mom said, uh, well, what would you learn? Well, Jesus turned water into wine at a wedding. Well, what would that teach you? If you're going to have a really good wedding, you better make sure Jesus shows up. <laughs> if you're going to have a really good men's ministry, you better be making sure Jesus shows up. So here's the first thing. The first strand of that is your senior pastor. He better be a man who cares about discipleship. Obviously, you two guys, you uh, three churches, that's a concern. You care about men's discipleship. That's why you're here. Probably at the behest and request of your senior pastor. But here's how you can support him. <clears throat> Number one, pray for him. Don't just say you're going to pray for him. Ask him, Pastor, what can we pray for you? And then pray with him. I had a man at my church when I pastored in Tacoma that never prayed for me. He prayed with me. Anytime that, uh, you know, every time I saw him, Sunday morning, you know, grocery store, wherever it might be, pastor, how can I pray for you? And I said, well, we're praying about this. And he'd put his arm, stop, right? Wherever we were, put his arm around me and pray. You can do that for your pastor because he does it for you. Pray for him, with him and for him. And then support him. Let it be known. The men's ministry of this church is, has got our pastor's back. Support him. You know, you, you probably have heard this. I pray to God you've never said this. Pastors don't live in the real world. You ever heard that? Pastors don't live in the real world. And you know what? It's true. Because if your neighbor calls you, he calls to say, hey, my son got in the Naval Academy. Hey, my daughter's on the honor roll. Hey, we're having a grandchild. That's what they call you about, right? The pastor picks up the phone at 2 in the morning my son just got arrested for drugs. My daughter is pregnant. Uh, you know, that's what the, the real world is for pastors. They get that all the time. They live in the worst part of the real world. And so they need your support. 
They don't need to be picked apart. They don't need to be, uh, you know, criticized, judged. You know, the, the old joke of roast pastor for Sunday dinner. They need your support. And let it be known, the men's ministry is the number one supporter of the pastor. Uh, and, and be there for him. Number three, by the way, the other thing that you should never say about a pastor, or I'll hunt you down. <laughs> he only works one day a week. Don't ever say that about a pastor. They don't even have business hours. It is a it is a twenty four seven job, and even when they're not at work, even when they're not, you know, working on, there's always that sermon. You know, Sunday's coming around with amazing regularity, and there's always that sermon, and it is in his brain constantly. He's thinking about that that verse, that illustrate. So pray and support him. Number three, and this is critical. Inform him as a men's let him know what's going on. Don't, don't surprise him with, hey, we're doing this great thing. And when he knows, the women's ministry is doing something on that same date. And do you know that if women's ministry and men's ministry are doing something on the same day, who's watching the kids? <laughs> and so who suffers? Men's ministry. It, it's always going to be that. So communicate. CC him on all the emails. Don't surprise him. Number four, another critical one, include him. But ask him how he'd like to be included. Hey, pastor, we're having the retreat. <coughs> We'd love to invite you to come and be just pastor or, or just, just Johnny. You just come whatever way you want to be. If you want to pray, if you want to speak, if you want to you know, participate, we'd love to have you. But we'd like you to just be there as a man. Just, just come and relax with us. R include him in the way they want to be included. And then love him. Show that love. You know that one morning I woke up in Chicagoland, I woke up to this scrape, a horrible scraping noise. And I went over, threw open my window, and there was a guy plowing my driveway. We'd had a nine-inch snow, and he's plowing my driveway. And he plowed it for the next five years. I never worried about snow on my driveway. He's, we haven't lived there in a year, but my house is still up for sale. He plows my driveway every time we get a snow. Why? I love you, Pastor. Just, just here for you. And that spoke volumes. Mow his yard every once in a while. You know, just come over and say, hey, how can we, how can we help you? Got any projects that need to be done? And, and do them. Just show him love. Send him on a vacation. <laughs> Especially if his preaching's bad. You know, send him for, <laughs> just teasing. <laughs> Extended vacation. <laughs> All right, the next one is your passionate leader. Let me go to your passionate leader. The passionate leader is your William Wallace. You know who William Wallace is? Braveheart, freedom, paint your face blue. Ah, we, we got to win, men. And, and he is the guy who has all the passion, eats, sleeps, drinks, thinks about men's ministry. He wants to see men saved, but he cannot be a lone ranger. If he's a lone ranger, he will burn out. He's doing everything, you know, working this, doing all the different work. And as a result, when guys don't show up, because inevitably guys don't show up to men's ministry stuff, he's going to burn out. We had a guy that killed our men's ministry for two years because he was doing everything. And he called this prayer meeting because, men, we've got to pray. And he showed up at the parking lot, and no one else did. And he had a smartphone. He, we wish he would have had a dumb phone because he wrote this missive and I mean it blasted it was titled where are the men of Alpine and he blasted them and he blasted them so far back into the, into the past it took us two years to rebuild a ministry to men because guys didn't want to show up when he was the leader so it came down to taking this passionate guy and saying you can't be our men's leader anymore and it hurt me it hurt him. He left the church. But we started building a ministry to men after that. And then we got up to the 211 that I spoke of. All right, the third thing, leadership team. The leadership team, Patrick Lencioni wrote a great book called The Advantage. And he talked about two types of teams in that, in that book. There's one that is the, the basketball team. They wear the same uniform. They show up and uh, practice the same. They show up at the game wearing that uniform. They set picks and give passes and defend and rebound and do all of this together. They are a unit as a team. 
And then the second kind of team is the golf team. I played golf in high school, and I was on the golf team. And we rode the same van together. There were seven of us. We rode the van to the golf course, and we wore the same uniform. We all had our polo shirt that says LCHS Grizzlies. And then we didn't see each other until our round was done and we our, turned our scorecards in. And even though we were a team, we were all a bunch of individuals. Your team cannot be a golf team. You may go golfing together, but you can't be a golf team. You've got to be not the doing team. If you are the doing team, you are primed for burnout. You've got to be the team that, that well, let's, let's take a look at what this team does. They're the vision casting team. The leadership team is the, is the guys who say, we're going there. That's, that's the mountain we're going to take. Now, to get to that mountain, I need 10 guys who are going to help build the ladder going down, who are going to build the bridge going across, and who are going to build the rope ladder going up. Who's with me? And, and so the, the vision casting team is the ones who, not if they're doing all the, everything all the time, they're cheating other guys out of being doers. So this team focuses on there. Don't get bogged down on the process or on the structure. Let other men serve there. They are also the planning team. They plan um, the process, slow and steady. Again, the cafeteria trade, they're thinking, if we're in this season right now, by the way, this is another thing that's in the action plan, so I'll hold this up. This actually comes from these notebooks, these challenge notebooks. It's a 16-week, it's a 36-week process. 16 weeks leading up to an event. The leadership team works this 16 weeks. How are we going to get there? Who do we need to have doing what? What, what needs to happen for us to do, have this event or this program or this day special? And they're also taking the next page. I can turn it. They're taking what's going to happen 16 weeks after the event. What are we going to be doing? That, you know, so they, they're working this with a team, but they're planning this. And they're thinking through how are we going to get guys to commit to the next step, which we're going to cover in just a little bit, so I won't belabor that. So they're planning. And then they are engaging. That engaging goes back to that circle I drew earlier of knowing the five types of men. I heard this, and I've shared this, and Kurt said this morning that he has learned to repeat this. I heard this about a college sociology class that uh, did a man-on-the-street survey, so I'll ask, what's your name? Bill? I'm going to ask you a question, if you don't mind. How you doing? Okay. Number one answer given, as a matter of fact, uh, Matt, Matthew, what's his name, has written a song about, I'm fine, doing fine. Hey, I'm fine, doing great. That's the number one answer. A man-on-the-street survey from this college class, 99% of the guys, 99 guys said, doing some derivative, I'm doing great, I'm okay, doing fine. So then they said, okay, can I ask you a second question? <laughs> How are you really doing? Wrong answer. Number one answer given on the second time was, I'm tired. Men are tired. Do you know that? Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> That's the wrong guy. Men are tired. <laughs> Either tired or busy. But then on the street, they actually did this. They said, can I ask you a third question? What's your name? Okay. How are you really doing? I won't belabor that, but the, the number one answer given, how much time do you have? Because now you've gone from being polite to actually caring. You guys' role as a leadership team is to be the guy who says, how are you really doing? Because I guarantee you, when they walk in tomorrow morning and somebody says, how are you doing? Great, doing good. They're not going to give you, they're not going to pour out their life story when the, you've just asked them how you doing. But if you do ask them a second time, can I ask you, how are you really doing? His answer was that the number one answer most guys are going to, I'm really doing, I am doing okay. Okay, now let's put the smoke out of the way. How are you really doing? And you're going to find out that guys are hurting. They, they're, you know, again, tired or, or wounded or something's going on. So be the engaging guys. All right? The big idea, and this is kind of critical, Oh, the praying team also. They're the guys who are praying about every man in their church. Oops, it doesn't have the big idea on here, so let me just... Uh, 
it, it's in your notebook. The height of your ministry to men will be determined, be determined by the depth of your leadership team. Let me put that another way. The leadership team needs to be what we want our men to become. The leadership team, the leader, senior pastor, and the leadership team needs to be. So here's, here's a strange thought as you're thinking about your leadership team. If we go back to those five, five chairs, four, four of the five chairs, at least three of them, you need to have on your leadership team a cultural Christian. He may not be all that involved. Matter of fact, it wouldn't hurt to have a natural man. If, if you know that there's this guy that's just started attending church, what better place for him to be than with leadership Christians? To be mentored, to be challenged. But he brings into your leadership team a different mindset. He's not going to be religious, churchified. You know, he's, he's going to bring different thoughts, right? So is the cultural. Your hurting man probably needs to take a season off of the leadership team. He needs to be ministered to at this point. So if he's going through some crises in his life, give him ministry as opposed to making him minister. All right, so the next page is your leadership team audit. And this is, a, again, in this action plan, so we're not going to belabor it now. By the way, I'm saying, you know, you guys go through this. That's what God has brought me to St. Mary's for. I'm here as the, uh, basically the area director. This is what area directors do across the nation is take churches through this. So if I can be of assistance in sitting down with you and going through the action plan, meeting with you on your monthly or uh, weekly meetings might be tough, but I can be there on a monthly basis and, uh, and help out. So, so do this. Do the, uh, the audit questions that are down at the bottom and work on your leadership recruiting worksheet, which is the next page. All right, we doing okay? Ready to hit the next? The next page is all-inclusive ministry to men. That's the one we're going to cover next. The all-inclusive ministry to men. And remember, that's taking guys from the wide to the deep. Bottom line, here's what this uh, phrase, this point is saying. Your men don't have to be in your men's ministry to be discipled. We think we got to get them to come to our men's events. There are men who are already doing great things and maybe even learning and they're not in your men's ministry. They may be up in a sound booth. They may be ushers. They may be parking lot attendants. They, uh, there's any number of places that they are, but they, we expect them or want them to come to our men's events. This is saying, no, let's take men's ministry to them instead of asking them to come to men's ministry. It's including every man. So the question that's asked on the fir first top part of the page, what activities does my church do for men? What we think success is in men's ministry is butts in the seat. If we get more men to come to our breakfast, get more men to come to our event, get more men to come to our seminar, that was successful. The goal instead should be creating an environment where the Holy Spirit is leading every man, whether they're in the nursery, the Sunday school, the WANA, whatever it might be, into a discipleship relationship. So let's picture this this way. What if you were to go to your head usher? And you were to say to him, you know what, when you get all of your ushers together and, and you know, ask them to come about 10 minutes before, the, or before people start showing up, not before the service, before people start showing up, about 10 minutes. <clears throat> and then you have a verse ready that maybe ties in with ushering, ties in with welcoming, ties in with, you know, making this environment, this man environment. And give them that challenge of what do you guys think and how should we pray and then lead them in prayer. Guess what you're doing at that point? You're discipling your ushers. And you're discipling them to become disciple makers, especially if they're thinking, when that guy walks in and I don't know, how can I minister to him? How can I, as he reaches for the door, how can I minister to him? Or it could be the sound booth people. About five minutes before you normally show up, let's show up and let's do this. Or, you know, normal time, but let's start out our sound time with uh, you know, sound light tech time with a little bit of prayer and, and a verse that we're reading. So it's taking men's ministry to the men where they're at. So the, uh, the line is on there. The number of men in my church, you need to put that number down. What are the, how many men in your church? And the number of men in my men's ministry. And you need to put that number down. 
<laughs> but then you'll notice just below the real number of men in ministry to men, every man, every man in my church. All inclusive ministry to men maximizes the kingdom potential of every interaction our church has with every man. There are already incredible men doing incredible things, but we leave them out because they're not in our men's ministry. This mindset challenge is saying, start thinking of every man, every man in your church, in your men's ministry. So we have this other tool. <coughs> I've got a few sheets of this. Maybe, maybe we can make some copies, uh, not necessarily now. The, these are in there again. But they're called Faith and Life Objective Cards. The Faith and Life Objective Card, it, it, they, this is a whole sheet of business card size Faith and Life Objectives. And what it does is challenges the leadership team to think through, pray through, plan, vision cast. What do we want our men to be and to be doing by the end of this season? This season being this. This 16 weeks that we're going to be looking at, uh, you know, at, at the end of 16 weeks, we're going to do a Success That Matters seminar or a Rock Solid Men seminar or a Christian Man seminar. We're going to do one of these seminars that we're going to talk about why we do them the way we do them. So we're looking at this 16 weeks. What do we want every man in our church, every man in our church, to know at the end of this 16 weeks, to believe, and to therefore be doing? Faith and life objectives, head, heart, and hands. What do we want them to know, believe, therefore do? We want them to be better dads, okay? What do they need to know to be a better dad? What do they need to believe to be a better dad? What do they need to be doing to do that? So you, you guys set the objective, set the vision, start the planning, and then you give these to every guy. Say, hey, Joe, we're doing this thing, and this is your vision casting. We're doing this thing in eight weeks. We're going to be... We're going to be challenged. I'll, I'll pick this one up because it's right here. We're going to be challenged in regards to our success because every man wants to be successful. But are we being successful in things that really matter? So we're going to be taking a look at a seminar. And I, I'd love for you to be at that seminar <clears throat> because we want you, by the end of that time, you're going to know what is genuine success. You're going to believe that success is possible for you, and you're going to be doing what's necessary to get there. So I'd like to have you have this faith in life objective card and be praying about your part in this. So as you're building that mindset, eyes are starting, you know, the buzz starts taking place in your church of, oh, we're, we're going to be having this seminar. But it's not just a seminar. It's not just a time to get together. It's not just a, a time to eat. It's that there's a goal coming out of this thing. <clears throat> okay? So... Let's go to the engine. This is what drives your men's ministry. We get past this. All right. It starts with a center, vision. I'm going to ask a question. Why won't men commit? Don't want to look stupid? Afraid of commitment? Past hurts. Go ahead. Hardship? Okay. And then what? Okay. Fear of commitment? Okay. Actually, it's a wrong question. How many of you guys play golf? Play golf. Okay. Raise hands again. How many play golf? Okay, you play for free? You spend money to go golfing? What does it take, about a half, take about a half hour? <laughs> All right. It takes, what, 20 minutes, 30 minutes to play a round of golf? <laughs> How often do you play? Anybody in here play every week? Play in a league? Okay. So free? You play for free? <laughs> 20 minutes? 30 minutes? So we do commit. 
That, you know, so it's a wrong question to say, why don't men commit? We do commit. It's just we commit to things we want to do. So how do we get men to want to commit to their discipleship process? That's, ultimately, that's the question, right? How do we get men to want to commit to growing? Well, the, here, here's Jesus, or the Bible says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, and literally the, the word is translated, where there is no vision, there's no life in their eyes. There's no, you, you, have you ever seen people with shark eyes? Just dead eyes? <laughs> Look around Sunday morning. You'll, you'll see shark eyes. It, again, where there is no vision, there's no life in their eyes. So what is vision? Best definition I ever heard was from George Barna. You'll want to write this down. <clears throat> Vision is a clear mental image of a preferred future. Vision is a clear mental image of a preferred future. Now, men want to be part of something that's bigger than themselves, that has value, that stretches them. Men, men like to be stretched out of their comfort zone. They'll say they don't, but when they actually start doing something, count me in. And they want to do things with other guys. We really, somebody said earlier, fellowship. We do, really do like, you know what fellowship is? Two fellows in the same ship, rowing in the same direction. And so we, we want that. How do we provide that? Vision. I heard a, I, I tell this you know, pastor's jokes, they're, they're well known, that there was a guy that was, uh, it was in his living room, his wife was in the kitchen cooking, and she hears the cat going, so she comes in, and he's petting the cat as he's in a rocking chair, he's petting it from tail to head, T tail to head, tail to head. He goes, the cat obviously doesn't like that, he goes, my cat, if he doesn't like it, why doesn't he turn around? If we don't like what we're doing, turn around. You know, and that's, that's the challenge of this vision is this is what life could look like if you would turn around. But when I gave that definition, can somebody repeat the definition? Clear mental image. That implies a non-preferred present, right? It's implied, a non-preferred present. And if you don't like it, turn around. But we've got to paint a picture of what turning around is and what it looks like. That's our role as leaders. That's our role as pastors, as teachers, is to paint the image of what it could look like if you turn around. Now, normally in, uh, in, a, in the full session at this point, I'd call on a volunteer, give him a ball, and have him go off in a corner and just start throwing that ball up. And just throw the ball up. And then eventually, and then I ignore him. Completely ignore him. And I'm teaching the rest of this session. He's over there throwing a ball. And finally, you know, I've got him out of the corner of my eye. Uh, he'll stop. David Delk used to be our, our CEO. Um, he was almost sadistic with it. He would let a guy, his record was 11 minutes that he let a guy sit there and throw the ball up. And the guy did it. That's, that's amazing. He stood there throwing the ball up. And then finally, they'll, they'll put it down. Why'd you stop? Why do you think they stopped? Well, if, if you were that volunteer throwing that ball up and, and all of a sudden, you know, you stop, why would you stop? No purpose. There was no purpose. If I didn't see a purpose in what I'm doing, I'm not going to keep doing it. So let's illustrate this this way. We're having a breakfast this Sunday, Saturday. Would you uh, bring the orange juice? Certainly. He'll, he'll, he'll do a whole lot more than that, but you'd bring the orange juice. So next month, you know, Martin, Martin, uh, no, sorry, Martin's over there. Kurt, you did a great job with the orange juice last week. Would you bring that again this month for the men's breakfast? Okay. So the next month, we had breakfast again. 15, 20 guys show up. And I start walking up to Kurt, and he runs the other direction. <laughs> right? Why? He saw no purpose. Now let's put it this way. Kurt, we are working at changing the men in our church. We've got this guy that's going to be speaking from this book called Man in the Mirror. Because it talks about the 24 problems that every man faces. We've looked at our men. 
They're facing a lot of those problems. So we're going to go through that book by having a breakfast. We'd like to have you involved. Would you be willing to, let's start by having you bring orange juice. Would you bring orange juice? Now, instead of just having to do a task, I painted a vision for you. We want to change our men. Now, that was simple, and it probably is a little more complex than that, but it really is that, getting men to understand, this is why we're doing this. Getting their buy-in by painting the vision of a preferred future. You can start with the non-preferred present. Our, our guys are messing up. We're, we look around, we see a lot of our guys that are struggling, they're hurting, and we want to work on that. The 24 problems every man faces, we're going to address six of those problems in our breakfast. Would you be part of that? So, vision. Now, it should be on the page that has... Okay, let's do this first. The first thing about your vision is that it, it needs to create resonance. So here, here's what that means. Just do it. What's that? Just do it. Anybody know what that is? It's Nike. Nike. It should be. That's the first thing that pops in your mind when you hear just do it. Is Nike. You may not like Nike, but you know their, their phrase. Okay, let's try this instead. A few good men. Marine Corps. Do you know the last time the Marine Corps used that as their slogan, as their uh, advertising? It was in the 80s. <laughs> I think after the movie, A Few Good Men came out, they stopped using that. But, but we still resonate with a few good men. We, we know what that means. How about this one? I will make you fishers of men. We know who said that, don't we? And it resonates, visions of men. So your vision has got to be something that connects people at their gut level, connects men at their gut level. An image comes to mind. I mean, when you think of a few good men, I, I'll tell you what I think of with a few good men is not the movie, but they, they did a commercial where they had every guy whoosh, bring out his sword. And was, you just heard whoosh, whoosh. Uh, and it went all the way down the line, up this mountain, with guys holding their Marine sword. Whoa! I wanted to be a Marine. Matter of fact, I tried to sign up, and they said I was too old. I didn't like that. But, but yeah, there was a resonance there. So, does your vision, think about this, does your vision stir an image? Is your vision just a big paragraph on a wall that nobody can say anymore? You know, Capsulize that vision down into something that is bite-sized and connects. So when I was the area director of Chicago, our vision was this. And, and, and tell me what, what this does. We want to set Chicago on fire again. Is there a vision with that? It can. It can. But that was, that was our vision statement. We're here to set Chicago on fire again. And, and it resonated with people. And usually we got that. Uh, how? Well, what do, you, what do you mean? But I was able to explain that. We want to set people, hearts on fire. We want men on fire for their families. And it, it, it resonated. So does your vision stir an image? If it doesn't, change the vision. Or at least capsulize it down to say, this is what we want to do. The second thing about it, it's an internal planning tool. Your vision, the, the long one, the paragraph one, becomes a filter. <clears throat> We're not going to do that, Bill, because that doesn't fit our vision. We are going to do this because that will help us fulfill the vision. Does this, whatever it is, help us get there? A clear mental image of a preferred future, does this help us get there? And if it doesn't, it's just busy work, and we don't need it. Uh, Martin said earlier, guys don't have time for it. They're going to show up at every event because they're busy. And, get this, they have other choices. <laughs> they have better choices than what we're offering them. Unless we can show them this is probably the best choice for you to do. The third thing is, it's external call or slogan. Clear mental image of a preferred future. So, we call it, and I have not seen one of these in St. Mary's, so it may fall on deaf ears, your elevator speech. Is there an elevator in St. Mary's or Kingsley? 
Maybe if you go to some of the hotels, the two-story. The medical pavilion has one. That's right. I've been there. So the ele- you know what an elevator speech is. It's a speech. It's something that you could share going from the first floor to the 20th floor. you got about three minutes, two to three minutes, to be able to share this is why we do what we do. So here's an example. I had a young lady that came into my office for counseling. Her marriage was over. Her husband was having an affair. They had filed for divorce, and it looked like it was going to go through. So I counseled her, how do you recover from a divorce? But I said, how about if we bring Greg in and we talk with him? He won't do it. I said, ah, let's invite him. Greg came. We talked, and sure enough, he, w- he didn't want to do anything. I shared the gospel with him. I talked to him about what it meant to be a, a godly husband and what he needed to, to repent of and, and change. I, you know, I tried to share it in a man-friendly way, but Greg wanted nothing to do with it, and he left. <clears throat> At that point in Illinois, it was no-fault divorce. All you had to do was wait six months, and your divorce was over. Day of their divorce... I'm standing at my window. I didn't know it was the day of the divorce. I'm standing at our window. Our offices were in a different place than the church. And I'm looking at a tennis match that's happening across the street. And all of a sudden, a car that had been sitting at the stoplight whips into our parking lot. And a guy jumps out, and it's Greg. And he comes to my door, and he says, what are you glaring at me for? So I'm not glaring at you. So, Greg, what's going on? He goes, you know the day is the day our divorce finalized. I said, I didn't know that. He goes, well, I really don't want this. What are you doing about it? I don't know what to do. I said, I know what to do. I, you need to pick up the phone, call Donetta, and tell her you don't want to do this. Get her before she gets to the courthouse and have her come here instead. He picked up the phone. He called her. She came. I led Greg to Christ that day. He repented of the affair, called that woman, too, and told her it's over. Moved back in with Donetta, who graciously accepted him, started attending our church, And within four years, he was actually one of our elders because that man was on fire and just went for Christ like he had gone for sin. I want to see more grace. That's my elevator speech. That's Why do I do what I do? I want to see more grace. Now, I have a negative elevator speech that talks about a man that tried, you know, he wanted to save his marriage, but he couldn't stop drinking. He couldn't stop carousing. He couldn't, let's change that first letter. He wouldn't. And eventually his wife left him, got full custody of the kids. Three months after the divorce, he committed suicide. I don't want to see any more gems in my life. That broke my heart and breaks it to this day. I want to see Greg. That's my elevator speech for why I do what I do. Why do you do what you do in ministry? And you, you need to have that hard-punching elevator speech that stirs a guy's his buy-in and gets him to want to be a part of what you're doing. So basically, what this is challenging, don't invite guys to an event. They got a thousand other choices. Invite them to a vision. Invite them to a a heart, a change. Events are one choice among many. Vision is personal. Now, we we used to challenge names, have a name, you know, Iron Men. Uh, You know, we're men of God. We're the the band of brothers. And we, we would challenge, have a name, that really resonated and called guys. You know what? Then you have to explain it. It becomes internal language. But instead, just say, we're the men of agape. We're the men of southeast. Because then that's every man that's there. Hey, if you attend church here and you got the necessary biological parts, you're in our ministry. I saw a thing today. It was, um, who's, who's, the, who's the man's man? I can't even think of his name right now. Chuck, Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris said, I used to be a man trapped in a woman's body, and then I was born. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting way off base here. So let's go to, let's go to elevator speech. What does a disciple look like? Had hard hands. Here we go. All right. So this, how many of you have been to the uh, St. Louis Arch? Anybody? Did you go, did you do the movie and then go up? I made the mistake of uh, buying our tickets to take the elevator up and then going in and watching the movie of how this thing's made. And, you know, when you see the last scene of the movie, it's a guy leaning, leaning all the way, the camera's over his shoulder as he's looking all the way down to that last piece being brought up that's going to connect the two legs. The two legs were built, and they had these, you know, giant uh, cranes on them to lift the pieces up, and they were built independently of each other. 
together, but independent, till they finally came and met at the top. But when they got to this place where they were top heavy, they built a bridge across the top. And that bridge that went across the top was just a steel girder that kept the legs from collapsing. They could have said at that point, job's done. We connected the two. The, the goal was to connect the two legs. They're connected. We're done. And that's what a lot of churches do. A lot of churches connect the legs, and then we're done. So here's what the two legs are. It starts down at the bottom with vision. Vision. He said, clear mental image of a preferred future. After, oh, sorry. <laughs> After you've uh, shared the vision, now we have beliefs. And the beliefs, basically for a church, for men's ministry, we believe God is God. We believe the Bible is true. We believe that God sent his son, Jesus, to change lives, to give life, eternal life, and life abundant, to give hope. We believe that, right? That's a, that's a, those are rock-solid beliefs that we cling to and we build on. Then out of those beliefs come goals. If I believe that Jesus changes lives, if I believe that Jesus saves, well, let's set a goal. Would we like to see 20 men accept Christ this year? Yeah, let's set that goal. We want to see 20 men accept Christ. And so then we start with the strategy. How are we going to do that? How are we going to get 20 men? Well, we have to have uh, you know, an event where they're going to come together. We have to have the speaker. We have to have the, you know. And so we, we develop this strategy for building uh, a ministry that will reach our goal because we believe God wants to do this. And here's where we get locked in. We build structure. And that structure could be better named status quo. We just start doing stuff. We just start doing the same things because it worked before. Or here's, here's the, the three, two reasons. Two reasons we do stuff. We've always done it this way. The church up the hill did it and they were successful. That's usually why we do stuff. And we, we just get locked into this status quo of doing the same thing over and over again. You've heard the story of the woman that cut the ends off the ham, right? She, before she put it in the oven. So one day her husband said, what do you, why do you do that? Why do you cut the ends off the ham? What's wrong with that? She goes, because mom always did this. Well, why'd mom do it? I don't know. Picks up the phone, mom, why'd you always cut the ends off the ham? Well, I don't know, because grandma always did it. Well, why'd grandma do it? I don't know. Just pick up the phone. She called grandma. Grandma, why'd you always cut the ends off the ham? Because that's as big as my pan was. <laughs> and sometimes we just start doing stuff because this is how we've always done stuff. So we need to bury status quo. Because what happens once we get into that, we get into nostalgia. Man, I'm going to say, I'm going to step on toes. Man, remember when we used to have 100 guys come to our retreat? Why, do, why didn't that happen anymore? Why don't we have 100 guys anymore? And, and instead of really examining, well, because maybe we lost sight of the vision, we start questioning, well, why, why are we doing it this way? Who gave the authority to do it this way? Who said this is how we should do it? Who? And we start pointing fingers. And that nostalgia and questioning leads to polarization. We start choosing sides. And the polarization leads to apathy. Because I don't come to church to fight. <coughs> And apathy leads to dropout. So, how do we reverse that? How do we get away from this negative leg? We go all the way back down to vision. Why are we doing what we're doing? What, what's the goal that we hope to accomplish? Why did we start this? Are we, is it making disciples? And if not, is it time to stop? So, that's how we use vision to take this first step. We have 20 minutes, and we're going to cover the other three things. We may go a little bit longer, not much longer. All right, so how do we get there? <clears throat> the first thing is we create value. Create value. All right, that's the next page that you've got. Um, it's not marked as create value. That's over on the right-hand side, create value just above the vision with the question, what kinds of men do we have and what will be valuable to them? So 
I'm going to put this down for a second, and I'm going to show you guys something. So this is the first thing we're, we're challenging. Create value. Guys, we're good at creating value. Men's ministries are good at having a, a felt needs, a speaker, a, a challenge, <clears throat> the personal invitations, all of that are in there. And all of that is part of this uh, create value. Let's go to this. You've got to know the five types of men, what are their felt needs, personal invitations, and give men what they need in the context of what they want. You know, that's basically challenging them. Um, we want you to come to this, you know, how to be a better dad, because we know that's what you want to be, but we know they need Jesus to be that better dad. So you're giving them that context uh, all along. So the, the create value, do you have a question? Anybody? The create value is the first step. We're good at that. But here's where we fail, fall. Here's where we, we miss out. Next page. The capture momentum with the right next step. So I asked earlier, how many of you guys went to Promise Keepers? You went to Promise Keepers? Powerful day, exciting, challenging, uplifting, raw. I mean, we were raw, raw, raw. Uh, anybody go to Washington, D.C. On their, on their big million man march? I, I mean, talk about walking away from that thing. Going, Whoa. But what would you do Monday? Went back to work. Went back to work. With, uh, uh, Promise Keepers was and is. Uh, they're trying to restart. They were going to do a, a stadium event in Dallas and then simulcast it and then COVID hit. They're trying again for this August to do it again or July. But uh, they were and are a great ministry to create value. They did a bang up job of creating value for a guy to come and hear these messages and sing the songs and be with other men and be challenged. But where they failed, they didn't give a step to. They had step two. They have books, but they didn't give them to you that day and say, we're starting a group Tuesday night. We want you to be in this group. But, you know, they, there needed to be a second. My last Saturday, uh, have any of you guys heard of No Regrets Men's Conference? Yeah, it's kind of a localized, out of Milwaukee thing. They, they're trying to make it nationwide. My last Saturday as a pastor in Chicagoland, before I started nine years ago uh, this week, uh, so nine years ago this past Saturday, was No Regrets. Keynote speaker was Tony Evans. Heard of him? Oh, yeah. yeah, and he wrote the book Kingdom Man. He had not written the book yet. when uh, It was coming out later that year. But he spoke twice at this men's conference on ki being a kingdom man. We had 450 men in our auditorium hearing Tony Evans give this challenge on, oh, I mean to tell you, there wasn't a dry eye or an a, 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 a unpowdered heart, uh, you know, light your powder. Uh, they, they were, boom, ready to go. And I stood at the back because, again, I was leaving uh, right after this was done, I was preaching Sunday morning, and then I was leaving for Orlando to start my training. So I stood in the back, and I watched 450 men on fire walk out our door empty-handed. We didn't give them a thing. We didn't give them the next steps. And, and again, i got to be honest, I was uh, what I wanted to do, I actually went down to Orlando and said, here's the DVD of Tony. This is all we need to do. Give men this. They went, you know, kind of Kind of like, Ron, you know, just wait a little while and you'll see that's not all we need to do. And they were right. I wanted to just give that message because that message turned people on. But it didn't give them what do they need to do next. So guys, we do a good job of creating value. We're not very good at capturing momentum. We're not very good at the next step. Second gear material, it's called in here. Uh, <coughs> it's appropriate for, for the value. It's short-term, low pressure, low commitment. It's believable and achievable. So here's what we do. <coughs> I'll hold up rock solid now. Day of seminar. This seminar is based off of 1 Corinthians 16, 13. It says, be alert, uh, be strengthened, be a man, be kind and loving in all that you do. Okay? Uh, I forget the fifth challenge here. But those are, those are the five sessions of this seminar. Guys sit in the seminar, and they fill out the blanks as we're giving the message. 
and then they have a uh, discussion time. There's the group discussion questions. They find out every guy that's in here is just like me. I'm not, I'm not failing. I'm, I'm just as stupid as they are, and they're just as stupid as I am. They go through this session <clears throat> on a Saturday. And then after the third session, we give them this. And this is their six-week follow-up. That is a full week of lesson, that. You can tell it's not. You don't have to do a lot of preparation. You don't have to do a lot of reading. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You're going to come and you're going to discuss with the guys that you were sitting at that table with during the session. Now, you find out that, well, this guy can't come Tuesday night. Well, you go over to the, that group on this last couple of sessions and you sit with them. Or you sit over there with those guys. And you build this group at, at the seminar. At this, you're building this. You notice this is black and white, kind of, kind of, this one's got color and life and lots of things to do. <coughs> it's got some uh, next step challenges in it. We get guys to sign up at the seminar for this. So they come on Saturday. By Tuesday, they're in a, a small group. By Wednesday, Thursday, the next Saturday. And this goes for six weeks. And then at the end of the six weeks, we give them a challenge. You know what? <clears throat> this has been good. I've enjoyed getting to know you guys. I'd like to take a next step. So this is an example. This isn't the one that goes with that. But I would like for us to go through this book. This is 10 weeks. And it's man alive. And it challenges the Bible characters and what made them like Jesus. Let's go through this. Together. Easy to read. It's large print. Small chapters, and it just gives guys a next step to take, <clears throat> which we're going to get into the capsule or the sustained change. But you get the point. Capture momentum <coughs> at the thing. Don't wait. Here's what normally happens. We go to Promise Keepers. We go to No Regrets. We go to Iron Sharpens Iron. We go to a men's breakfast where there was this powerful speaker. And then we come together as a men's leadership team saying, that was really good. You know what? The guys were fired up. We need to get them in a group now. Well, uh, let's start training our group leaders, and you know, we'll recruit them, and then we'll train them, and then we'll get them. And by the time we are ready, the fire's out. They're long gone. Would you agree? Yeah. So we capture momentum right now and, and get the on-site commitment now. Show men the right next step. And then the last, well, the next page is actually... is actually an exercise for you to do. This again is in the action plan. What, what do you have going on right now that creates the value and captures the momentum? <clears throat> do you have anything like that in your church right now? Just going on that where you, you created the value to get guys to come, people to come, and then you have the natural built-in next step. If you don't, that, this is the exercise to start thinking through that. What are we doing as a next step and guys, if you don't walk away with anything else in just a few minutes, walk away with this. Every time you do something, every time you have an event, every single Sunday morning, what are we doing to give guys the next step? You know, and and you're, the leadership team has got to be constantly thinking, next step, next step, next step. If you don't, great events just fall by the wayside. <clears throat> and then when you try to do it again, get into the status quo, the structure, and people stop attending. Ah, we've been there. We've done that. As a matter of fact, Promise Keepers, the first time we went to Promise Keepers in Seattle, I was pastoring in Seattle at the point, first time we went, we uh, chartered five buses to take us from Tacoma up to uh, Seattle. Five buses that held six, 60 guys each. We took 300 men to Promise Keepers. And I mean, those 300 men on the bus rides back, they were singing hallelujah. It was wow. The next year, Seattle, we took two buses because that's all that signed up. The next year, they all would have fit in my minivan. Why? Been there, done that. We didn't give them the next step. And that's going to be true of, and again, promise keepers didn't go down in their quality. It's just that been there, done that. So that's the typical of man. We need to make sure that we are <clears throat> taking the next step. Last point. I think we're done 
after this. Um, sustain change, sustain the momentum. And the, if you could only do two things, get men engaged in the regular study of the Word of God and get men into authentic relationships with other men, those would be the two most critical things for your men's ministry. Get men engaged in the regular study of the Word of God. That means you're getting good studies, and there are so many of them. How many of you are familiar with men's fraternity? Uh, it, it's now kind of evolved into 33, the series. Tremendous stuff. But if you're just doing the stuff without the capture momentum, it's, it's not going to last. <clears throat> the, but we use men's fraternity. Here again, I can tell the story of not capturing momentum. We had the first year we did men's fraternity, and it's 24 weeks. It's 12 weeks of packing the little boy and 12 weeks of packing, the, you know, becoming the man. And we had over 200 guys signed up and showed up every Thursday morning at 5.30 in the morning because most of our guys caught a 7 o'clock train for downtown. Every Thursday morning in, in bitter cold, one of the most joy-filled mornings of my life doing that ministry was I, I was running a little bit late and I was pulling into the parking lot and I had to wait to turn into our parking lot. I had to sit there for uh, the cars that were coming the other direction for about 10 minutes of guys pulling into our parking lot on a morning that was minus 6 degrees. That's commitment. And so they showed up. So we offered it again. Second year, men's fraternity. Instead of the 200 plus guys, we had about 100. Still good, but about 100. We offered the third year. Nobody signed up. Same stuff. So again... We need to have that capture momentum. We, we've got to give guys the vision. This is what we're doing. Where we failed is we didn't tell guys, you've been through this. Now who are the three you're going to invite? Who are the guys you're going to have? Because this, this has changed you. And look at what we want to do in our church. Who are the guys you're going to invite? So it's all about the capture momentum and then sustained change. Sustaining change is building the relationships and getting into authentic, uh, uh, the regular study of the word of God. So the picture that is in your, uh, on your page is these four pillars. You see them, softball team, worship service, adult classes, small group. So again, we don't necessarily have the skyscrapers here. <coughs> You've been in the city where there's the skyscrapers. So imagine you're in Chicago. You're downtown Chicago. You're wearing your bulletproof vest because you're downtown Chicago. And you, you're standing with your host and he points, he says, you see across there, that building over there? There's the best restaurant. They have the best steak that you've ever had in your life. Let's go. And he goes back, takes a running start, and jumps across the street, lands on the roof of the building over there. And you look at it and go, there ain't no way. So you go the elevator down, walk the streets across, elevator back up. When we're challenging guys to take that next step in their spiritual journey, we're basically taking the running leap and we're jumping across instead of giving them a bridge to get from there to there. So the sustaining change is building a sky bridge. It's literally helping a guy take the next step by creating the bridge to this. The people doing each of these ministries has a passion to do on, on those four pillars. They have a passion to do their ministry. You talk to a, any of you guys as churches have a wanna. Awana ministry, no, uh, approved workmen are not ashamed. You ever talk to an Awana leader, they are a, a, almost a cult. They are just, they're crazy. They love their ministry. I mean, they, they're winning kids to Christ, and they are passionate about this. We had a guy that they wear the primary colors, uh, you know, their teams represent primary colors. He had shoes that were the four primary colors. He wore pants that were the four. It was crazy. He loved his ministry. And if you said to him, hey, Ricky, we need to see your guys get involved. Uh-uh, you're not taking my guys. They, you know, they were his. And that's what uh, the people doing those ministries have a passion to do, not to connect. So we've got to be the guys as an outsider to show them how they can get their men to be in other places. We're building that bridge. Connect men to the best disciple-making processes in our church. It's not, so here's the point, bottom line. It's not about creating new ministries, new events. It's linking people to the events that are working. If something's working, how do we get guys to bridge to that? How do we get them to be 
involved in these things. That's part of that, and it's part of the action plan. So design steps and the relationships. So the last page that you guys have, and I think it's up here. is this. So the starting point of Committed Men, we, we have an event. We create value. And they love it. But it, not everybody stays. Not everybody stays committed or stays connected. So as a result, those that do stay, they seem to be doing pretty good. So we capture the momentum and we lose a few more. But we sustain the change and we keep these guys as disciples. Now, <clears throat> throw numbers in there. And, you know, over, over time, we're not going to keep every single guy. Let's just face it. Guys have other choices, and uh, Satan is hard at work of keeping them. But if we, if we don't create the value, and sustain, if we do sustain the change and do all that, look how many more disciples we have than when we started. We started with this amount. Now we've got this amount. And if we do this cycle again, create value, capture momentum, sustain change, we'll grow even more. That's where we, I gave those statistics, 48, 84. We get 84% of the men involved in the discipleship process. That's pretty doggone good. If we don't do that, I think it's on here. Nope. If we don't do that, here's what we do. We get it sky high, promise keepers, and then we drop down. So now we got to work extra hard to get them to come to iron sharpens iron. And then we drop back down. And then we work extra hard to get them to come to no regrets. And we get this roller coaster that each time the hill doesn't go quite as high until it flattens out. Or <clears throat> we have a leader that's passionate and excited, but he gets burned out. So we bring it, you know, there's a, there's a thing called the light bulb method of pastors. This one's burned out. Let's unscrew him and screw the next guy in. Screw the next guy in. <laughs> uh, so we do that with men's leaders. So it's important that we are building this. Create value, capture momentum, sustain change. Create value, capture momentum, sustain change. Uh, guys, it's all about the capturing the momentum right at the event. So I've, I've thrown an awful lot at you, <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to throw literally the uh, action plan to you and the opportunity to go through that. Any questions on, I mean, we drank from the fire hose today. Any, any questions on anything we covered that you're going, I'd like some more explanation on that, or what's next? What do we do next? I will challenge you, and uh, Agape is going to be doing, they're, they're taking this next step. So you guys that are at Agape, you don't need to, you'll, you'll be hearing about it. We just are introducing a brand new seminar called The Christian Man. It's based off of Patrick Morley's newest book, The Christian Man, and it deals with lust, it deals with uh, marriage, it deals with parenting, uh, work. It's, a, it's 10 things that make the Christian man the Christian man, besides his faith and his, his faith walk. But they're going to be doing the seminar, and then there's a 10-week mentoring guide follow-up for this particular one. So they're doing that in March, and I'll encourage other, you other guys, you might want to take a look at these different seminars and say, yeah, let's do one of those. And um, <clears throat> I happen to know one of the faculty members of our teaching team. He lives very close to here. It's me. Uh, so uh, I'd be glad to come and do a seminar with you. <clears throat> and we, then the capture momentum step, taking the next step. That's one method, events. It's not the only method. It's a good method, a great method if you do the capture momentum, but it's all about making disciples. All right? Thank you guys for being willing to do this. Thanks, Agape, for hosting. <clears throat> so I'm going to try to keep my voice long enough to close this out in prayer. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these men, the churches they represent, the families they represent. As we started out saying, as goes the man, so goes the church. As goes the church, so goes a culture. We're watching a culture unravel. And we know that it's because, in many cases, the church has unraveled, and in many cases, because men have unraveled. I thank you for these men who not only want to stand 
with you, for you, on you, in you, but also want to see other men take this step. So, Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom, strength, the resources, especially the power of the Holy Spirit, and help us, Lord, to do what needs to be done to make a difference in the men in our churches, in our cities, in this county, Lord, in this state that needs to see your reality, in this nation that is desperately in need of seeing you in this world. Help us to be men who would start that fire and sustain it by our own walk in you and our witness of you. Thank you again for your grace, and we pray for your strength and wisdom. In your name we pray. Amen.